This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we have made it. We are here. We are at episode 100 of Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. And just very from the very jump, I just have to thank you guys so much for listening in because I got to be honest, whenever I started this podcast at the end of 2017, it's like, okay, let's just put this out there. Let's see if anybody listens, if anybody likes it, and if they like it, we'll keep going. Well, we made it to episode 100, and it's because you guys like it. You're leaving reviews, you're sending us emails, sending us messages on Instagram, letting us know that you like the content. But I just got to be honest, all right? I wanted to do something special for you for episode 100 of this podcast. I didn't just want to do the same old, same old with you guys. And the number one question I get about this podcast is, Kyle, I love this podcast, but why don't you do interviews? Which is kind of funny because it's like, uh, am I not good enough for you people? It's like, come on. But the number one question is, why don't you do interviews? And and I always say, well, it's because... I talk about these deep topics and I want there to be a narrative arc. And, you know, if I'm talking to somebody else, you can't really keep control of that narrative and blah, 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 which is the answer, right? That's not a BS PR answer, but that is actually the answer. But just for you guys, just because I love you, just because you've supported us so much, I wanted to do a very, very special interview for our 100th episode of Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. And immediately when I started brainstorming who I would want to interview for this podcast, there was one name that came to mind, and that was Eddie Penny. So if you don't know who Eddie Penny is, he is the CEO and founder of Contingent Group. So that was founded back in 2013. But that is a worldwide risk mitigation and security consulting company. They also do executive asset protection a lot of the training that Eddie does has to do with, you know, self-defense techniques, uh, firearms, combatives, uh, shooting techniques, breaching execution, just a bunch of different things. And the reason why he's a worldwide expert at that is because he spent 16 years from 2000 to 2016 as a Navy SEAL, and he was in DevGrew at the time, and we will certainly get into that a little bit later. But before that, from 1996 to 2000, he was a part of the United States Marine Corps. He was an infantryman and the urban terrain instructor. But Most importantly, and the biggest part about his bio is two things. Number one, he's the first ever guest on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. And number two, he is my friend. So welcome, Eddie Penny, to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thanks, Kyle. I really appreciate you having me on here. I'm uh, super excited to uh, get into this. So thank you again for having me. How's that for an intro? Man, I just built you up. was good. Dude, I was like, yeah, I, hey, that's 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 a good one. <laughs> I wanted to get you fired up. I wanted you to get like at least a little bit, you know, a little bit of a sweat going just from the intro from the outset. But man, I want to go ahead and launch in. And, you know, a lot of uh, these conversations can turn into, you know, your boring uh, typical interview. So we're going to do our best to not let that happen. But as opposed to you talking about, oh, where'd you grow up and all that kind of stuff. I, I want to kind of start with, obviously, you are well known for your military accolades and even post-military, a lot of the things you've done to support the military. But what, what I'm curious curious about, and I'm sure our listeners are curious about, is growing up, did you always know that you were going to end up being in the military, that you were going to end up being a commando? When did that kind of come to fruition for you? Uh, that's a good question. Um, as far as I can remember back, yeah, I, I was like, that was that was it. Um, I, I think it started, you know, probably when I was, gosh, old enough to kind of like go out in the streets and go play in the woods, probably around I don't know, when I was in the third, fourth grade, whatever. I, mean, I was always in the woods, you know, and then my uh, my parents were divorced, so I'd go over to my father's house, and you know, and he, he's a man, he's a man's man, he's like my hero. So uh, he would always have like Rambo on, or you know, some kind of like Total Recall or some Schwarzenegger film, and I was just like, I was just glued to the screen. I'm like, I want that, I want to be that person. <laughs> you know, I would like, how do I go get the Rambo necklace, the bandana around my head, like in, anything that could just possibly get me there, uh, you know, in my young mind. I would do that. So, I mean, it was pretty much, I wanted to do that. I wanted to go uh, be that guy. Um, you know, there was, there was times growing up, I'm like, you know, there was a couple weeks or a month, like, oh, I should be a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, but, you know, it always went back to the military. And that's just, um, I remember one time where it, where it all kind of started is I went to a, a Cincinnati Reds game with my mother. And it was, it was a nighttime game. And it was during Desert Storm. So, it was, that would have been 90. I believe it was 90. And, uh, you know, everyone stood up for the, uh, the national anthem, you know, put your hand on your heart, um, you know, the correct way to show respect for this amazing country. And at, at the end of it, you know, these planes flew over and they were probably like, you know, some fighter jet. I don't know what they were at that time. So, so young, but they flew over and just the, the, like the feeling that I got, like the vibrations and the, uh, the sound, 
that filled my soul and like all the flags. And back then they had this like Eagle sticker. It said, support our troops with the yellow ribbon. And it was just awesome. I just had that prideful feeling like American pride. And I loved it. I'm like, so I talked to my mom. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do when I get older. And it wasn't so much to be a fighter pilot. It was like, I want to support this country. I want to right. serve the country. And that's, that was, I, that was the day that it clicked like, okay, this is it. And then from then on, I was like, all right, what, what do I, how do I train or what do I need to watch? Or, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but uh, in my mind I did. <laughs> so that was yeah, absolutely the actual one point in my life where I like, I mean, I still remember it. I remember I, I can still visualize, um, you know, that image is in my brain of those planes flying over and just the, uh, what, how I felt. It, it was amazing. <laughs> Right. I mean, everyone kind of has a different story. Some people do it because, you know, they, they got in trouble, so they had to go do it. Or some of them mm-hmm. planned that in their, their entire life. And for me, I grew up in Fort Sill, uh, which is where uh, or I grew up in Lawton, which is right next to Fort Sill, uh, one of the biggest uh, artillery bases for the Army right. in the United States. And so I was constantly around military. And when I was a little kid, I told everyone, I was like, look, I'm either going to be a major league baseball player, but then I stopped growing at 5'10". So that was kind of out of the question. <laughs> but then it was like, I'm either going to do that or I'm going to go into the Army. But then, you know, you go along, you start playing sports, you get scholarships for other things, and, and then you don't end up serving. And then you end up kind of where I'm at now in my early 30s thinking, you know, damn it, I miss I miss this opportunity to really serve this country. But for someone like you, you, you kind of knew that's where you were going to go, and that's kind of where life took you. But, I mean, mm-hmm. you, you started out uh, in the United States Marine Corps, so I want you to kind of give us an idea of, okay, you went to the Marine Corps in 1996. You know, why did you choose the Marine Corps? But then also, you know, just about four or five years later, you became a Navy SEAL. So kind of talk us through that transition. Okay. So uh, I always wanted to be a SEAL pretty much before I joined the Marines. And then I had a buddy, I, I swam in high school and a good friend of mine, um, he was one year above me. So when he was a senior, I was a junior and he decided to go to the Marine Corps. He went down to Paris Island, and his family asked if I wanted to go to the graduation, you know, travel down there and watch the graduation, take a tour of the uh, of the base. And I was like, heck yeah. Uh, so I did, and when I went down there, you kind of like the same feeling, like I want to do this. You know, I see the, the obstacle course, and, you know, they're fighting with the pugil sticks, and just the marching in formation. I mean, God, I mean, knowing now, I mean, that's, that's just miserable. But, like, at the time, it's like, wow, that looks so cool. Like, everything's, you know, with all the, the guns everywhere, and I don't know. I just liked it. There was just pride. Everything was clean and crisp. And then when I got back, I'm like, definitely the military, definitely leaning towards the Marines. Uh, talked to, I don't even think I talked to the Army. I think I did, I did talk to the Navy and I talked to the Marines and the Marine recruiters just seemed more on point for me. Uh, I just, they're more organized, I guess. And then just, you know, being down at Paris Island obviously gave them a leg up. So I was like, sign me up right now. Uh, and so I, you know, I did the Marines. That was pretty much it. But I, you know, Growing up, I wanted to be a SEAL. Like, I always wanted to be a SEAL and just, and I'm glad I chose, like, a, a lot of people ask, like, are you, are you upset that you decided to go to the Marines first? And, and absolutely not. Um, it's a great, great outfit. It's, uh, I got, I matured. I mean, I was, I went in at 17. Mom and dad had to sign for me in boot camp. I had my 18th birthday. I did not tell a soul. <laughs> um, hey, yeah, no, no kidding. But yeah. Like, just don't do that. So it's like, I'll just have my own birthday as I lay here in my rack and go to sleep. Good night. <laughs> Uh, but no, it's just, it was, uh, I matured a lot from 17 to, I guess, what it'll be, uh, 22, 23. And then around my three year mark, I'm like, this is not enough for me. And I was going to go back, uh, get out, go back to Cincinnati. I was like, I'll just be a cop, uh, not to just be a cop, but I just wanted to get back, like, just something in that arena, like where there's, you know, fighting for freedom or, or some th- keeping, you know, neighborhood s- safe, something like that. That's what I want to do. And I kind of like debated that for about a month or two. And I was like, no, this isn't, no, that's, no, that's not going to be enough. So went to the Navy recruiter. What do I have to do? And it used to be, I guess, a couple years uh, before I decided to do this transition that you could just kind of like swap over, go to buds. And um, if you make it, you make it. If you don't, they would either, you know, Navy would retain you or they would send you back to the Marine Corps, depending on, I guess, the need. Uh, I could be totally off on that, but that's what I, how I was explained. Um, so I had to be completely out of the Marine Corps, and for the, like, the last year, I just trained for it, ran, swam, you know, put on the camis, would go to the, uh, you know, on base. I would just go swimming all the time and just, like, really put myself, start hitting the weights real hard, and, um, you know, got out, and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. This is it, and there was no, there was no looking back. There was zero looking back. I'm like, this is it. Uh, you know, my, my mindset was on point. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And no one's telling me no. And I had a lot of naysayers, a lot of, not really naysayers, like you're not going to make it, but like, Hey, 
you know, kind of like the roundabout, like, hey, you know, not many people make that, but it's it's kind of the same thing. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, I do, and that's, I'm not going to be one of those. I'm not, I will not be that statistic. Uh, it's just not going to happen because I'm very stubborn. <laughs> so <Right. laughs> I'm not going to. That's not going to happen to me. And I really believe that. The only thing I really worried about was uh, injuries, which I sustained one uh, in the beginning of buds and in indoctrination phase. But I just kind of worked through it, and I was okay. Uh, thankfully, right before you know uh, day one, week one of uh, buds. But uh, yeah, I mean that was it. I was just like, let's do this, and uh, you know, met great guys. Uh, hung around with wonderful people and just, you know, if you, you know, they say, you know, you are who you surround yourself with. So I just made sure I picked good personalities, good, fun people, people that weren't, that were positive and uh, the rest is history. Awesome. And we'll certainly talk more about how you kind of create a tribe like that later on. But, you know, you mentioned something earlier about the Marine Corps and the recruiters. That's something I've heard a lot of different places. People talking about how the Marine Corps has you know, the least amount of resources, the least amount of money, like they don't have, you know, the prestigious university to point to and all those different right. things. And yet they still crush it because the, the thing is, is when you come in and you sign up to be a Marine, there's no questions, right? There's, there's no, Oh, what am I going to be doing? Am I going to kind of be in the back or no? And like all these people, they want to go to war. They want to fight. They want to fight for this country. And so you kind of, you know, got into why you joined the Navy and why you got into the seals. Uh, but the, the thing with that's interesting about that is everybody wants to talk about buds right buds is at the of top course. of everyone's mind because it's in all the movies and we see the youtube videos and like oh, okay it's so brutal and again you, if i asked you about buds you'd be like yeah it was really hard you know i had to work through injuries like you've already said but for, for me what i want to know is was was there anything that came up mentally during buds that you thought okay i'm really stubborn and i'm gonna make it like i'm gonna get my trident but this right here, I don't know if I'm good enough to do this. I don't know if I'm good enough to do drown proofing. I don't know if I'm good enough to make it through the next mile of this run with this heavy boat on my head. Was there a time like that that, that came up for you where you're just like, man, I'm going to make it through, but how? Um, no, uh, it never came up. I never, I can never remember. I think in Hell Week a couple times, probably around day three or four. I was like, man, I could totally quit right now. And then like two seconds later, if that, I'm like, yeah, but you're not. So quit thinking about that. Um, so no, I, you know, there was really, you just, you're, you're surrounded by these guys, you know, like, um, yeah, I, it was on a movie or you heard, I can't remember where I heard it, but like, you know, you got like the best athlete over here and you bet the best athlete. Well, you got, you got all these alpha stubborn males coming into one place and it's a competition between, I mean, we're, we're together working to, uh, as a team. I mean, you heard it on uh, fearless, right? You know, the, right. Adam and uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but they just kind of like this little competition going on, this unsaid, unspoken competition. Uh, it, it's like that with a lot of people over there, and it, it drives you. It's it's amazing. Uh, so I, you know, you, you watch people in front of you, like say it's the fifty meter underwater swim. You know, I watch a couple guys go. I'm like, I'm, they're no better than me. You know, I'm, I'm no better than them. I, I'm just not going to quit. They didn't quit. I mean, it sucked. So I'm going to just go, you know, embrace the suck factor and go do it. So. I guess that was just kind of my mindset. Like everyone, else, if people did it before me. I'm no different than them. There is no, like, they're not this Avenger or this superhero. You know, they're human, just like me, created amazingly, as we all know. And um, I'm just going to go do it. I wouldn't let my mind. There was one time, uh, during, it's funny you say drown proofing, or it was during pool comp. It's in second phase. They kind of mess with you underwater and stuff with your uh, twin 80s, which is a, you know, the double tube scuba tanks on the back. And one of the, the tasks was you had to jump in with twin 80s on your back uh, with fins on and keep your hands above water and tread water for five minutes, which I was a swimmer. So I'm like, this will be so easy. There was no practice for it. You just jump in and did it. So all my buddies do it. A lot of them look like they did with ease. And for some reason, I, I it sucked. I was like, man, <laughs> this is so hard. I did not. It might be my quads are burning. But then, and like, and this is within the first 30 seconds. I'm like, I've got five minutes of this. This is a long, this is going to be a long five minutes. But uh, I remember looking on the, on the pool deck where all the rest of my class is sitting and they're just kind of all watching. And, you know, who knows what's going on through their minds. They're thinking the same thing. Like, I hope I do this. I hope I pass and just, you know, get this one down to move to the next event. Uh, but I'm like, I can quit right now and go recover for a couple minutes, but I'm going to be right back in here. So just let's knock this out right now. And be done with it. This is going to suck, and it's going to suck if I try it again or you know a third time. So, uh, luckily, I just sucked it up and I knocked it out the first time. But that was the one time 
that I can that's distinct in my mind and buds where I was like, man, this is this is tough. This is very tough. Like they're very good. They will find your weak spot. They are so good at it. Uh, I, I can't. I don't know anybody that said, yeah, that you know, someone has that story maybe on a couple events. Um, but that was definitely mine. And I mean, I was one of the best swimmers in our class. And I thought, man, that thing smoked me. I, I can still like my legs are burning right now just thinking about it. So <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it smoked you. Moment. It oh, smoked yeah. you by design, right? That's oh, kind of yeah. what you're saying is they, oh, they were going to yeah. find yeah. it. Well, that's so that's interesting to kind of hear because, you know, if you do a lot of reading on buds and all that, you, you kind of get this idea that you can't make it through unless you have that stubborn mentality. Uh, even if you don't have the kind of that natural alpha quality to you, it's like you're doing this together, but it is an individual event. It, it's almost like uh, right. being on a wrestling team where it's like you compete as a team. So you win or lose as a team, but you're out there on the map by yourself. And so right. it, it's a little bit, it's a little bit disjointed in that way. But so, so you make it through, you get through buds. Uh, you obviously you get your trident and, and then you're a Navy seal. And so um, you were, you were placed on a team. You were placed out on the East coast initially, weren't you? Correct. Uh, team. Okay. Two. So you're on team two, but obviously what, what everyone's going to be interested to hear about is you being in dev group, which if, for those of you that aren't familiar, that's D E V G R U. That's the development group. Um, and in order to get on that group, uh, you have to go through kind of green team training and screening and those types of things. And, and this team within the Navy SEALs has become incredibly popular. It's, you know, become this part of legend and lore, but most of the people just know about a, a mission or two that this team that dev grew has been a part of, but there is so much more about dev grew. And, you know, there's not a whole lot written about it, even in a lot of these memoirs that we see. So I want to, I want to kind of get an idea from you as to, okay, how did you even uh, get selected to even try and screen for green team? What was that like? Compare it to, you know, buds and, and how difficult it was, but then obviously I want to kind of get a sense of what it was like when you finally got on dev grew and what did you do for us when you got on there? I paid off a lot of people and I said, please help me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that would have been the easy route. Um, so when I, what was explained to me when I went to, when I remember checking into Buds or the day before, I went up there with a good friend of mine and he had a, he had a friend that was in the teams already, I think a team five or something. So before we even checked in for Buds, he like walked us around uh, Coronado and, you know, San Diego and just kind of like showed us around and, he kind of brought up dev group and I was like, uh, what, you know, what is, I really, I mean, I kind of knew about it, but didn't know. And he's like, and he explained it is it's kind of like the super bowl of the teams. Like it's a super bowl team of the teams. Not, and that's kind of like stuck with me. I mean, that's just the way he described it to me, uh, being there and doing it. And I mean, I just think they have a lot more assets and obviously, you know, the longer, like in the NFL, for example, if I'm in, you know, the NFL for five years versus a guy that's a rookie chances are I'm going to be a lot better if I'm not injured. Right. So kind of the same thing, just more training, more experience, more schools, uh, more leadership you've been under to, you know, to lead in, in, in pretty crappy situations. Uh, but no, Green Team, it, it was a butt kicker. I think it was, in my opinion, it was harder than Buds. Uh, it's more of a, it's kind of the same thing, but it's operational. It's operational stuff. So you're doing real operational stuff, but it, it uh it's a butt kicker i mean there's there's guys that i that were my mentors that were getting kicked out and i'm like what's happening right now uh nice. it's just it's crazy it's just like you see the guys that you did you know did a couple of deployments with already uh overseas into uh combat areas and uh they're getting kicked out like uh day two it's like well this is gonna be a long six months so i mean you just go over you know real operational stuff and search and insertion extraction platforms you know helo stuff jumping all that kind of stuff um but it's it's very intense. It was really cool. It was a great experience. And the way you get there is you kind of have to do a, a couple deployments. You have to go through a board. You have to be recommended by your command. So you kind of have to have a clean slate. You know, not you know doing the right thing, not getting in trouble. Um, then you go over there, do sit and stand in front of a board. They ask you a bunch of questions. Why do you want to be here? You're you know you're in your dress uniform, and they kind of just drill you a little bit. Some of the guys you might know. Some of the guys you definitely don't know. And they just drill you and they kind of make their decision who's going to class up uh, that year. And I was fortunate enough, I was actually deployed in Afghanistan. And, and then we switched over to Iraq, same deployment. And a guy that, that guy that's been over there, he asked if I was got selected. I go, no, I am got pushed. I'm going to go to training for six months and then I'll go. And uh, we, we formed a really good relationship. Uh, happened to get in like a firefight together. So like a little bond was kind of bor uh, born between us there. 
So he made a call. Uh, you know, I didn't know about this. And he's like, hey, you're going to the next green team. And I was actually about to cycle back home. And green team was starting in a few weeks. I was like, oh, my God, I'm not in running shape. I was like probably 225, just jack and steel the whole time. <laughs> I was like, I mean, you don't you don't tell them no. You're like, okay, so I got to start running. So, I mean, literally, I remember he told me that. I'm like, I'm going for a run. So I just started running and running and running because for me, that's my weak spot. Like, I, I'm, I, I'm not a bad runner if I'm training for it. I just hate running. I, I really don't like it <laughs> right. at all. I'll swim all day. I don't know what it is about running. I just, I really, I'd rather get beat with a baseball bat than go running. Uh, so I uh, just started training for it. And, you know, the once I did that initial screening test and get that run out, I was good. I was like, all right, here we go. I mean, you still do runs, a couple long, long runs every week. And I was just like, I'm just, you know, again, embrace that suck. It's just part of it. It's the nature of the beast. Because I know on the outside of that, like once I'm through this, you know, from what I heard is like, you can kind of do your own workouts. You can kind of like, okay, cool. Like running is going away and we're going to make sure this happens. Cause that was enough drive for me right there. Get rid of this running piece. So, uh, but man, it was a, it was a great experience. The instructor cadre, amazing individuals, combat. I mean, especially what was going on in the world. They were uh, all experienced combat fighters. And it was just, a, I, I was, I was so humbled just to be in like their presence, just being around. Cause I, I mean, I went to combat a couple of times, but these guys, I mean, when, I mean, you're getting in firefights, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for, um, you know, overseas with this, with this, um, alpha to, you know, be in, uh, firefights a couple of times a week. It's, a, it's just a normal thing. You just kind of like, that's just, that's just part of the, that's the nature of the beast. So, uh, but, it, but it was great. I, it was, I, I'm so fortunate, so blessed. I, I, it was great. I can't say enough good things about the people that are over there, the people that were running the show when I was there. I was very fortunate with my mentor um, who kind of got me over there. So, yeah, I, it was a great time. I loved it. So how long were you actually in green team? Uh, or it's, in it's, it's six months for the training for a uh, green team. And then I was over there for about five, five and a half years. Um, yeah, I think that, that's about right for timeline wise. And and so what what is the op tempo like being on dev guru versus being on team two or one of the other teams uh it's just a longer we call them workups it's a little bit when you're on the uh like when i was a two it's a little bit longer uh workup where the op tempo is a lot faster uh because you have to do uh, other commitments while you're back in the states so it's not it's, you, know, you know you don't go on deployment come back and you're off until your next deployment there's other things you need to possibly stand up for um that could come up so it's without getting too crazy into the weeds, it gets um, it's pretty, it's the up tempo is crazy. It's it's no joke. Guys get worn out. I wouldn't say worn out, but um, but the experience that comes with it is crazy. I mean, it's it's definitely hard on the families. Uh, mine in particular, it was definitely hard on that. Um, but it was it was I mean, it was a great time. But yeah, the up tempo is pretty crazy. <laughs> but that's what you said. Yeah, I can imagine. There. Yeah, I mean, that's why when you're on that elite level of a group inside of an elite level group inside an elite, you know, <laughs> military, like it's kind of one of those things that can kind of be expected. But um, I got to kind of tell the the listeners about how I figured out that you were on dev group because you never told me, right? Because you're a jerk. And it's like, I've known you, I've known you for years and you didn't just like, you know, drop that on. I knew you were in the military, knew you were a SEAL. But I'm reading uh, a book for the first time. And it was Fearless uh, by Eric Blem and it was about a deceased Navy SEAL named Adam Brown. And so I'm about halfway through or, uh, the book or so. And, you know, I'm, I text you and I'm like, hey, I'm reading this book right now. It's pretty awesome. And I don't even know if you remember this, but you're like, hey, have you gotten to the part where they had the Humvee accident? And so, uh, from what I can remember, yeah, there were two Humvees that were, uh, you know, both both Humvees, military, U.S. military Humvees that, you know, in, in kind of the dust and the milieu and the confusion, they had actually ran into one another. Yeah, we and had Adam a, Brown, Brown was yeah. six, I believe, and I think they had like four in their vehicle. So, you got six coming one way and like four coming the other. So, it was, it was, a, it was a train wreck or Humvee wreck. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And so in the story, like as I text you, I'm reading about this story, right? Mm -hmm. Where where Adam Brown's Humvee is flipped, his hand, you know, was outside of the window. And so his hand kind of gets crushed. And you're asking me, you're like, hey, have you gotten to the part where he basically had his fingers sewn back on in the field? I'm like, yeah, I literally just read that like two minutes ago. You're like, yeah, I did that. And I was like, oh, dude, that's crazy. Like, what, what crazy timing that this was happening. And then I text you and then this goes on. But then I'm so stupid that it took me like two days to realize, wait a minute. The only people that were on that mission at that time were in DevGrew. 
holy crap, my buddy Eddie was in dev group. So it like hit me all at once. And so first of all, you're a jerk still for not telling me that you were that for like the longest time, because that would have been awesome just to know that. But for, for the listeners out there that don't know about Adam Brown, which if guys, if you haven't read Fearless yet, I've only talked about that a hundred times, you have right? To, that is my to. number one book that I've ever read in my entire life. I think it's going to be turned into a movie. It's insane. But, you know, tell everyone a little bit about Adam Brown and obviously let, talk a little bit about whenever his uh, his hand got all mangled. He was uh, he was a stud. I mean, he was he was crazy. And I mean that in every great way. Uh, that, that actually took place when we were at Team 2, that accident. So gotcha. Gotcha. I met Adam with, I think he did one deployment with four and then he came over to team two and that was my first deployment. So I think he had one, maybe possibly two deployments uh, be- more than I did when I checked in. I was a new guy there and met Adam. Uh, he's just, that guy's heart is just insane. He's a, he doesn't stop. I mean, he doesn't stop. Uh, the book really doesn't do a job. I mean, the book's amazing. I actually just listened to it again. Um, I drove up to Ohio to see my family. And I made the kids listen to it because it's just so awesome. And uh, he, he's just so good. So I met and knew there. We actually went to green team together. We were in the same green team class together. And then we went to the same uh, team once we got to dev group together. So I was with Adam for quite a bit, a lot of deployments. <clears throat> Did a, quite a few deployments with him. Great guy, just a stud. Uh, and just has a, always had like a good, and, and he, he was kind of funny is I was not a Christian back then at all. Like, the furthest thing from it, but like there was just something in my brain, like what, what is it? What, what is it about, you know, Christ and all this stuff. And, and I didn't know anything. And there's, there's a story for that, um, <clears throat> which we'll get told about later. Uh, but I would, I would kind of ask him once in a while, like questions about it. And he would, you know, he would very, he was not pushy, which is awesome because we know pushy people that, you know, are trying to push that often kind of can deter people away from Christianity. And he never did that. Right. Just very, gentle very uh methodical on the way he like talked to me because i, I mean <clears throat> you know one wrong word i'm like okay you're screw this i'm out of here you know but like i mean very very mature very close-minded um but he was very good about it the way he described it and he would put it in terms where i understood it uh more like neanderthal terms i think that'd probably be the best way <laughs> uh, he, like it was, it was just he was just a great guy like he was just an amazing amazing man uh his family was first and I didn't know about all, I knew about some of that stuff. I didn't know how crazy, you know, the, the drug use was until I, you know, read the book and all that stuff. But I, I, I mean, I knew about it until the book came out. Then you really kind of get into the weeds on it. But the guy, the guy's a phenomenal operator. Uh, I remember being, you know, doing jumps with him and we would have to, cause he had one eye uh, towards the end <clears throat> and we would send him, he was always the last guy and he would be a couple seconds after cause one eye is closed and we have all these canopies in air. You know, we don't want, uh, I mean, you're taking out about well, 50% of your vision. So we would kind of, but he would still join the stack. He was just always the last guy. Uh, so it, it was just amazing. He had to, you know, relearn shooting. I remember being on the range with him, kind of going over like, hey, let's try it this way. Like to shoot with one eye, let's try it this way. And um, it was, it was, he's like, does it look weird? Do I look okay? <laughs> you know, because you want to look good. Like when you're shooting, you know, some things do matter. And uh, I remember all those things, they all just kind of come back and it's like, man, just want to <clears throat> just talk about a guy that will not stop, did not stop and inspired other people along the way that were um, <clears throat> in this in this unit with him. And he was just it was amazing. And, you know, and then, <clears throat> you know, when we were, I was listening to the book uh, where he got hurt playing football. Right. We were, in the stadium. Yeah. Up in Detroit. Uh, if it was their old stadium. And we're like, hey, let's play football. I think it was actually Adam that picked up the ball. He's like, let's play. Like, yeah, we've got a half hour, hour. Let's let's play. And we were like, man, we can't get hurt. We can't get hurt. And then literally every one of us kind of at the same time are like, well, Adam's going to get hurt first. So <laughs> if he gets hurt, we have to stop. Sure enough, like two or three plays later, Adam gets hurt. We're like, all right, this is this game's over. We literally just had this conversation right before because it's usually Adam because he just goes – you know, a million miles per hour, no matter what he's doing. And, and, uh, he just happened to get, get kind of jacked up on that one. So, but yeah, well, it's that, that the, the thing about the thing that's interesting, Eddie, about how you talk about Adam is, I don't know if you noticed this, but you talk about him in the present tense. You talk about, you know, Adam does this, Adam is this. And, you know, obviously if you've read the book and you know anything about Adam Brown's story, he passed away a long time ago, mm-hmm. but it, it almost seems like, 
y'all had such a deeper level connection to where it's almost like you know you, you cognitively you know he's gone right but yeah i mean you still talk about him like he's here yeah i don't like i obviously lost a lot of guys and i don't i don't really look at my like, i know they're gone i know it's past but i still think of him like i can still see him doing some of the things i can still hear them saying some of the amazing things they said uh getting a little choked up here uh just i guess that's kind of maybe a way i kind of like deal with it but i like i to me, they're you know we always say never forgotten, and I and I don't forget. I, I mean, I'll I'll be going to get some food or you know walking through the grocery store, and literally someone will pop up, and I'm like, ah, oh, I remember we were in the grocery store acting like idiots, and he did this, and and I just get a big smile, and I'm like, that's right, he did, and just uh, happens all the time. It's beautiful. Uh, I love thinking about them, and they uh, they definitely impacted my life, and uh, I know I know they had, like their families and everyone they came in contact with, they had to impact them in the same way. They were just amazing amazing human beings i mean just gosh i mean I, once you meet them and you just see all they did and then once you know once they pass you kind of look back you're like oh my gosh i was like what a learning experience and at the time you don't realize it i mean that, they're kind of kind of like life right there you're like you don't realize it in the moment until like a little bit after you're like wow that was really special so <clears throat> Well, I appreciate you sharing that because I mean, that's that's the sense that I get, Eddie, whenever I'm like reading these memoirs or watching these movies or something like that, is that these are all very, very incredible people. But uh, to shift gears just a little bit, that that kind of takes me to my next point, which is this this seeming trend for, for us on the outside, for us civilians uh, of these famous seals. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you know, you've got Robert O'Neill that wrote The Operator. And, you know, he's obviously the guy that took out Osama bin Laden. Um, you've got Marcus Luttrell and Lone Survivor. You've got Chris Kyle and, you know, uh, the American Sniper. You've got, you know, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. Like, you know, they, they've written a bunch of uh, or they've written two best selling books together. But Jocko obviously has his podcast and other mm -hmm. things. And so the thing, though, for me is because I, I eat all that stuff up. I love reading all that. But you don't seem to get as much fanfare or as much of that from, you know, SF or Green Berets or Marine Recon or something like that. So I just want to kind of get your generic thoughts on famous seals because obviously the old frogman from the past it was like we're the silent operator you know we, we don't really talk about it but at some point you've heard jocko especially talk about this a lot these stories need to get out there mm -hmm. and if you're going out there to be famous we don't like that inside the community no. but if you become famous because of who you are we we're okay with that but well, what does eddie penny think about that side of it uh i mean there's there's definitely um Obviously, you know, media, you know, we're talking about old frogmen, um, you know, they didn't have Instagram, they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have, you know, it kind of, they also didn't have, you know, a decade plus war going on either, where all these heroic things happen. So, uh, you know, minus Vietnam, I mean, when there were some phenomenal stories and some great heroes that, you know, that I've met and heard their stories, but they didn't have that back then. And there, there are some books that these guys put out, but obviously we're in the present. And, you know, some, unfortunately, some of those amazing stories and amazing accolades these guys did kind of like get pushed back a little bit just because we're kind of focused on what's in front of us, which was Iraq and Afghanistan and all this, this uh, global war on terrorism. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's any difference between, you know, an SF, uh, SF book or a SEAL book. Uh, we, maybe we're just better marketers. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, they, they do wonderful things. I mean, wonderful things all the time. Uh, I, I don't know if we're, I know that like we get put, uh, the unit I was with and um, Army has one as well. From what I, I, I was told, we did towards the end of Afghanistan, we did 80% of all com combat offensive operations. That's a big wow. number. That's a huge number. Yeah. So a lot of people on the defensive, we were out there like every night, us and another uh, counterpart unit with the Army, uh, operating pretty much every night or every other night. So 80% of all offensive operations, that's a huge number. So obviously crazy, and, and this is not to take away from anyone else overseas, because like I've said before a thousand times, it takes every piece of the military to make that that machine to work overseas in crazy uh, situations. So everyone is vital to the, the mission at hand, which is winning and taking down the enemy. So I don't want to take away from anyone, but it's just that's just our part. That was our part. Um, and that's what we signed up for. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't think there's any difference. And I, obviously the media is going to give you tons of, um, uh, you know, exposure and people, and I, and I agree, I used to be the guy, especially when I'm in, one thing I learned is when you're in, you're like, oh, those guys are 
talking about what we did. We're supposed to be in the shadows and stuff like that. That's great. But like, I always use this example as Black Hawk Down, uh, when we lost 19 Americans uh, back in 91 or 92, I believe, in Somalia. We've seen the movie, probably read the book a couple times. Uh, that one operation, that one operation changed the Special Forces community forever. Uh, on certain things about night vision, ammo count, food and water, um, assets. I mean, it changed the way we operate. And it, it's, it's, and it happens quite a bit. It's like this bad thing happens, but we learn from it and we move forward and we save more lives. So if that story was not told, we would, you know, they might not, people might know about it, especially guys that are operating and they need to know about it. It's, um, it's kind of like being a doctor. You have this amazing doctor that just learned how to, um, you know, make, someone that's blind, they can see now. Don't you think you should go out there and tell other doctors about it? Sure. I think, I mean, what's, there's no, there's no difference. This might be a little sexier and it's more in movies and, um, you know, younger generation loves it. Like, just like we, um, I did, you did, it sounded like. So I think that's really it. So I think it, it's huge to get it out there and let people learn. And cause I mean, we, we need to bring this generation in to uh, fill those shoes cause the military needs more people. And in 10 years, they're gonna need more people. And those kind of stories, you know, they fill your brain. You get smarter. Uh, we've read Gates of Fire. You know, I mean, we just keep going down. We watch 300. All those things just kind of pump you up, get you ready for it. Um, so, no, I used to <clears throat> used to be a naysayer. Now I'm not because I, I have a totally different view on it. And you should share your wisdom. Obviously, some things um, uh, don't need to be said or, or are not allowed to be said. Uh, but but no, I, I think it's I think it's important to pass on to the next generation uh, that people that are coming in and learning from these things. It saves lives, in my opinion. That's my personal opinion. It definitely saves lives. When I think motivation is obviously important because, you know, when when the operation took place to took out that took out Osama bin Laden, obviously that put a lot of focus on a particular group of Navy SEALs, but then mm -hmm. the Navy SEALs in general. And then you have, you know, the Lone Survivor book, you've got uh, American Sniper, you've got the operator, you've got all these books that came out um, and you know, you have these, these kids, these 15, 16 year old boys that are alphas and they're like, well, I don't know if I want to play football for the rest of my life. And then they find this and then they're like, I'm going to be a seal mm -hmm. or, Hey, I'm going to go to the Naval Academy. And then I want to go to buds right after I graduate. And then you're going to get these elite level people that are going to be going into these elite level forces. And the, the sense I get in from what I hear, obviously recruiting has gotten easier. Uh, I mean, e I say easier, but like recruiting people and you're getting more of those people in, you still have a high attrition rate and you always will. And you always want that, mm -hmm. but it, it is kind of one of those deals where, okay, if you wrote a book because you wanted to be famous and the reason why you went to buds in the first place is so that you could have a big podcast someday. All right. That's a little shady, right. but at the end of the day, <laughs> to be honest, from a civilian perspective, Eddie, I don't don't even care about that. I, what I care about is when you're overseas, you're keeping my butt safe. Right. right? And so, cause I'm sitting here in my studio in the middle of Oklahoma and I'm not worried about someone coming over my fence, trying to get me from another country. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm not worried about that. And it's because of the people over there on the front lines. But I wanted to go back to, to something that you said, because I'm, I'm really curious about this just recently uh, on the Jocko Willink podcast. Uh, he had on the guy who wrote outlaw platoon uh, platoon. And so he, he, um, was this young kid who was put in this leadership position and his platoon was overseas for an unbelievable period of time over a year. Mm -hmm. And, and stuff that they went through was absolutely insane. But in that book, I remember reading it and he since had to kind of, when they did re uh, reruns of the book, uh, they put a, a letter in the back of it because he's kind of softened his stance on it. But he remembers being so frustrated when he would get back to base after being out, you know, you know, out outside the wire for 10 days, no shower, you know, hardly any food, you know, get, going, uh, getting thirsty at times and all that and just getting shot at all the time. And then they get back to the base and, you know, these guys that have been sitting there, you know, running the mail or cooking the food or whatever, you know, they took all the hot water in the showers. They said, hey, you know what, you know, I'm going to get in line in front of you. And, and he just remembers this unbelievable sense of frustration and anger towards these people that they would act that way. And so for me on the civilian side, I'm like, man, for me, there is a difference between the frontline fighter and the support staff. So I will thank everyone for their service and I will pay for their meals if they're if they're eating in fatigues or whatever the situation might be. But it's hard for me as a civilian to square what you said, which is, hey, we can't be out there 
you know, breaching doors and, you know, doing capture kill missions without the support staff. But help me as a stupid civilian understand why it's equivalent. Uh, I wouldn't say equivalent. It's just different jobs. They they chose to go be, well, chances are they chose to go do whatever they're doing to support, right? And some right. of those individuals did it for various reasons. I did it to support my country. Uh, I wanted to be in combat. Some of those guys, you know, and ladies, they do it for a college education. Some of them do it, like you said at the beginning of this podcast, they do it because they got in trouble. They had an option, jail or military. Right. Uh, so we all have our different reasons, and everyone has their own little story, as you know. Um, but bottom line is when I come back, you know, from doing an op and there's food waiting for me, I'm appreciative of that. I like that. <laughs> I like that it's warm. Is there times when there wasn't food and I was kind of upset? Yes. Uh, I remember, I remember a Thanksgiving dinner being overseas and we were planning an op and they're like, Hey, you know, dinner's here and it's like supposed to be this nice Thanksgiving. And I don't know if they didn't get the number right or whatever but i went in there with uh like probably six or seven as i were planning we were doing the some charge calculations for explosives or, or something and we go in there and there's literally some bread left and some gravy i was like <laughs> well this is funny <laughs> so i had like a can of tuna uh and 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 well bread and gravy so i mean it's like crap happens it does uh was i upset at the time oh my god yeah i wanted to uh murder someone uh, but now I laugh at it. It's like, that's, that's actually kind of funny because I mean, it's just, it is what it is. You're over in combat and, you know, and then I look at guys that are in Vietnam or, you know, World War II, like those guys, in my opinion, are, are like studs. Cause I mean, we have all this stuff, you know, people are, they were getting all these packages over from people and, uh, you know, all these goodies and candies and food and all that stuff. So, it, I mean, all in all, it was good. I really can't, we're, we're there at war. That that's, that's the end game. We are there at war. That is our that is our job. Uh, so any anything that's nice and comforting is is a, is is nice. It's a what, what's the word for it? Um, it's, just, it's just nice to have because I really don't. I would never not expect it. Like there was a weight room for me. That that was huge for me. Like that was that was great. I loved it. Um, I always had water. Always had food. I mean, the, don't get me wrong. You know, the outlaw platoon that you're talking about. I know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah, it sucks. Like you guys don't understand. I come back and like you guys have no clue. What goes on outside these gates? I remember thinking that, but you know what? That's that's okay. That's all right. It's not. Um, I have a mission. They have a mission, and I'll carry out mine. As long as you do yours, we'll be good. So I guess that's kind of my stance on that. Gotcha. So the the cool thing about how long your military career lasted it was from ninety six to two thousand and six. Correct. Uh, two thousand sixteen. Two thousand six. Oh yeah, two thousand sixteen. That's what I'm saying. So uh, that's a long time in the military. And so the cool thing about being in for as long as you were in is you got to serve under a bunch of different administrations. So you started your military career, you know, under the Clinton administration, transitioned over to the Bush administration, Bush the younger, and then you, you know, you kind of wrapped up uh, with the Obama administration. But yeah. but also you see guys in now, and from the outside, it looks like. People, especially in your community, love serving under the Trump administration. And so kind of give us an idea of and it might be a little bit hard because, you know, in Clinton administration, you're in the Marines and you're, you're just trying to, like, figure things out. But, you know, then you're you're doing basically your entire uh, SEAL career half with the Republican administration and George Bush. And obviously we go to war at that point. Mm -hmm. And then the other half. The other eight years are under the Barack Obama administration, and he's very famously known for going around the world and apologizing for American might and decreasing the size of the military and decreasing the funding. So just kind of tell us a little bit about what that was like serving under different administrations and what it's like for your buddy serving under Trump now. Um, well, it's, that's a tough question because world events change with each administration. Different things are popping up here. Things are going away. Then another thing pops up here. Um, a lot of it is due to the administration before. A lot of it is just has nothing to do with the administration at all. It's just turds want to be turds overseas. Uh, so <laughs> I guess the biggest thing that I that I really I mean, when I was young in the Marines, I didn't I, mean, I wasn't deploying. I really didn't understand that piece. I didn't understand money and funding that came in for military's units. I, I really I didn't understand it because I was so um, soaked up on my own little reality. Uh, when I got over to the teams, kind of learned a little bit more about funding because funding's huge because you need operational gear and training and all that stuff. And I remember, I do remember under the Obama administration, and, and real quick, let me say this real fast. Um, I, 
I, I am a Republican. Um, I always vote Republican. Uh, but regardless who, who is in that office, that is my president, the president of the United States of America. And I, that is, that is what I stand like, we'll protect and follow orders for. Uh, so it's not, you know, kind of hear that like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do this because, of, because he's my president. Like, it's none of that stuff, man. It, it's, he's still the president of the United States. That's like telling your kid, oh, you don't like the principal? Well, go tell that principal whatever you want because it's freedom of speech. That's not right. 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 It's called disrespect. Um, so, and it's not okay. Uh, so I had to get that off. Like I, I, you know, I didn't like, uh, I wasn't a fan of Obama at all, but still I went on many ops with him. I have met him. I've talked with him on the phone after certain operations. Only thing I remember is a big thing that I can think of is like funding was a huge issue. Funding cuts, uh, for certain things that might not even pertain to, um, you know, national security or whatever. So that was probably the only thing is probably funding cuts is the only thing I'm like, wow, okay, they just took that percentage from us. That's not okay because we need that for this with all that's going on. Uh, but the crazy thing is, is it was kind of explained to me is when I was younger is like Republicans like bigger, more conventional style fighting, I guess you could say. They don't, they don't mind leaving a big footprint, obviously, like, you know, all the stuff over in Iraq and all that, that stuff. But like, Democrat side, they kind of like leaving a small footprint, which means more work for spec ops. Uh, you know, Republicans still use them, but they, they, I mean, they'll go to their go to is spec ops. They use the crap out of us a lot during that, uh, his administration, which I'm thankful for. Uh, do I agree with everything that was done? Absolutely not. But, um, I'd say the biggest thing that I recognized kind of going away is the funding, especially when we're the go to, you know, like you're using us for all these things. We need this, this, and this, and you just took away, you know, X amount of dollars. And and I hate to put it all on money, but you know, money again, it pays for training, it pays for assets, uh, it pays for you know foreign relations on on certain things. So um, it's it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. So that I mean, even for us on the outside looking in, like we saw kind of the strain. And and if anybody lives in a military community, you can like feel the strain on some of the families and especially people that are higher up in the officers. But I mean, you make a great point about Barack Obama because ideologically he and I disagree on literally everything. Like there's not really anything that I agree with. (laughs) But but here's the deal is if I had been invited to the white house for something, right. For whatever reason, and I was going to get to meet the president, I would accept the invitation. I would show up in my best suit. I would make sure that everything was straight and good to go. When he came down the line, I would shake his hand, look him in the eye and say, thank you so much for having me, Mr. President. I appreciate you. Because at the end of the day, he is my president. But for you in the military, he's your boss's 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 boss. You know, like that is the guy. He is the head of the United States military. So disagree with him, disagree with the things that he says on CNN or whenever he's out on a stump speech, but it just kind of is what it is. Uh, but one thing I, I, I really want to get your opinion on this guy, because, you know, Trump has had quite a few characters in his administration and I'm not asking about Trump yet. We'll get to Trump. But uh, my favorite person so far in, in his administration, either still there or not there. Number two would be Nikki Haley. I love Nikki Haley, but is General Mattis. Mm-hmm. Because if there was, if I were to create a mean old curmudgeon bulldog general, I'm pretty sure I would create something close to General Mattis. And anybody that in an interview, I think it was with uh, 60 Minutes or something like that, you know, uh, the guy basically asked him, or, you know, like, uh, General Mattis, you, you've been in a lot of operations. A lot of people have died under your command. You've killed a lot of people under your command. You know, uh, does that keep you up at night? And he goes, uh, nothing keeps me up at night. I keep people up at night. Like, people are up at night worried about what General Mattis is thinking. So, so what are your thoughts on General Mattis? Uh, I, I don't know too much about him. Obviously, I know all the uh, he's kind of made been turned into like a Chuck Norris character, which is kind of kind of funny, kind of <laughs> cool. Um, no, I mean, the guy brings one thing to the table that a lot of people don't do, and that's called intimidation. And some of that intimidation is, is backed up and has been backed up. And I think that's huge because at the end of the day, there's a bad guy that wants to kill us. And, you know, if that guy is saying that, OK, well, you know, I might rethink some things. So. Uh, I don't know exactly the extent of everything that's gone up, gone on with the administration and with him, uh, but I, I had no, never had any problem with him. I, I loved looking at him, watching him, listening to him speak. Uh, the guy, you know, he seems like a tough as nails dude, and I think that's what he what we needed, especially in this country right now where it's not tough as nails. So 
Uh, I, I, I liked him. I, I thought he was awesome. Uh, I have no, no problem with him whatsoever. So, and again, I don't know all the details. I, I try not to, I don't get into that unless I need to get into it, uh, the political side because I just get upset. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I got to say about that. I really kind of ignorant on like his whole, um, his demeanor, but I knew, you know, he, he, his heart was in the right place in my opinion. He's a Marine through and through. You pretty much know that from the moment, anytime you hear him talk. So um, the kind of the last thing on the military side, and then we'll move into some other subjects is, and you and I've talked about this. I think when you and I, when I kind of figured you and I were, were going to be good friends for a really long time is we had known each other for about, I don't know, an hour. And, you know, we're sitting outside at some, some men's camp thing that, that we were both at. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we just start talking about just stuff, just life. But then we ended up talking uh, about a particular subject. And, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, Go but we, we were talking um, and, you know, you were in the middle of your spiritual journey at the time and you know, the journey that we're all still on at all times. Right. But I remember you talking about some ops that you went on and some guys that you lost. You mentioned losing a lot of guys, but th- this was a, a particular story that was very personal to you where you basically told uh, a member of your team to go to go over to this side of this building Mm -hmm. and he went over to that side of that building and uh there was an improvised explosive device that detonated Mm -hmm. and um then and he was killed and i remember you telling me you're like kyle if i hadn't told him to go over there he would still be alive and i've thought about that conversation a lot and, you know, I, I probably had a decent response when we were talking to, to each other at the at the moment. But it was basically like you, you couldn't have known that was going to happen operationally. You you thought that that was the best thing for, for him to do at that moment. It was the best thing for everyone's safety. It just didn't quite work out. But you you've you've had a lot of time now since you've been retired to look back on your military career, to look back on all those micro decisions that had macro consequences for the enemy and for the people on the same side as you. But, but looking back on your military career, what would you have done differently? And, and, and that can, you can take that in any way that you want to take that, but looking back, like, would you have gone to the seals first? I know you kind of mentioned earlier, like you liked your time in the Marine Corps, like, would you have spent more time in like, you know, what would you feel like you would have done differently if you could get a do over? Oh, you went for the drug on that story. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's uh, whew, yeah, that that story. Um, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think I can say I would do anything over because I'm I'm happy where I am. I'm happy I have a. I guess you know one thing that I always thought about is I always wanted to deploy more, uh, do more deployments, and and you know there's a good chance I wouldn't be having this conversation with you today. Um, as as you know, I got custody of my children. Um. And that 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 was a huge life changing experience for me. I mean, I wish I could have done more deployments, but at the same time, I wish I was there for my family more, especially my children more when I was deploying. Because uh, I, I mean, I was checked out. I was so checked out. I I, I tell this to you know to some people. Uh, there's there's a scene you've seen American Sniper. Obviously, we brought it up a couple times. Uh, there's there's a a scene where he comes back from I don't know what deployment, and he's just drinking a beer and he's staring at a blank TV. Do you, do you remember that scene? Yeah, absolutely. And I, like when I saw that man, I just I started weeping. I was like, "Crap, that was me!" Like I was, dude, you're. So, I was so checked out. Like I just, my kids are running around. Like, hey, dad, I'm like, hey, baby, and like I'm just like I'm I'm my body's there, but my mind, my mind was overseas still. Or like, hey, like that was a you know some kind of graphic uh, something that happened over overseas. So I, it's just that's one thing I wish I knew how to deal with better. Uh, and I don't know if there's an answer for that. There, there is. Uh, but, you know, looking back now, it, uh, it well, it kind of led me on my spiritual journey, which I am so thankful for, uh, you know, uh, the power through Christ. So, but um, I wish I would. I wish I would have had Christ sooner. That's what I really wish I would have had. That's probably the one thing that's actually a really good question. I think that's probably the one thing that I wish I had in my life sooner. Because, I, I mean, I didn't really find Christ until that weekend we spent together up in uh, open Oklahoma at that men's retreat. So. That's really what all kind of really, really started hitting home for me um, was actually because of you. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, I don't guess I did. So we did our little fire thing. And then, you know, I, I saw people getting just prayed for. And I was like, and like throughout the, you know, guys just start crying and they're getting hit. And and at first I'm like, man, that poor guy, like, you know, toughen up a little bit. You know, it's OK. Like, just chill. And then as things got going on and like topics are hitting you, you know, about the, you know, the father wound or or just uh, other things, you know, your family, 
And I'm like, crap, like, okay, this is starting to get to me. And I'm, you know, I'm praying for the first time, which is the most awkward thing I've ever done uh, at, to that point. <laughs> right. And, um, I was like, man, I really want someone to pray for me. Like, what does that do? Like, what is that? And then we were leaving the fire and you came up to me and you go, hey, can I pray for you? I was like, holy crap, I got hit so hard. And you came up and I'm like, here's this. I think you were 26 years old at the time. And I was think I was 32 or 33. I'm like, here's this 20, 26 year old coming up to me. Uh, you kind of know a little bit about me and you just went in right there and you're like, hey, can I pray for you? And I was like, you sure can. And you did. And I was like, wow. Like I walked away, started crying. It was amazing. It was, uh, it was beautiful. So I don't know if you knew that story, but there you go. Well, I'm glad I know it now for sure. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess, I guess the, the corollary for, for anyone listening to this, uh, is to, if you hear that prompting, because I, I kind of, I can go back to that, that point in my memory and, you know, there's, there's probably 50, 60 of us sitting around that fire and mm -hmm. we're talking about some pretty deep things. But then as you walked away, the immediate thought came to my brain. You need to go talk to him. He just walked away for a reason. He's trying to disengage, go re-engage. But the thing about it is, is as soon as that thought comes to your head, there are other thoughts that come to your head, which is, nah, that's weird. He probably just has to go to the bathroom. The like, uh, you know, this, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the devil. It's the devil whispering in your ear, right? It's, it's screw tape letters. It's just like, Hey, 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 just leave him alone. Give him some space. Y'all will talk in the morning. And then invariably, if I would have waited, you know, we wouldn't have seen each other in the morning. One of us would have had to leave early, you know, got distracted by other conversations. And so, man, I, uh, I'm, I'm ecstatic that, that you, you shared that with me. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, and, and I said I was about to get off the military thing. This is one more that that's kind of bridging the gap between moving from the military life to outside of that. One thing I'm curious about for you is one thing that I'll say for me personally is I'm always concerned about loss. Like I'm, I'm kind of a pessimist mm -hmm. uh, at my core, which is not really a very Christian thing to do, but I'm just kind of open about it. So I'm always scared about losing people. I'm scared about losing my wife. Mm -hmm. I'm scared about losing my dad. Like, like there are times with my wife where, you know, if I can't get a hold of her uh, for a long time, so like for several hours, maybe I've sent her a text or two and I know she's busy, but now it's kind of getting a little bit weird that I haven't heard from her. My mind goes to some crazy places as to where she is and, and what could have happened to her. And it's just from this, this place of fear of loss. But, but for you, you spent a long time in the military. I mean, 20 years in the military and you experienced loss as a soldier, but you've also experienced loss as a civilian, but before you got into the military and after you left the military, is, is there a fundamental difference when, when you lose a, a brother in arms versus, you know, somebody that's really important to you on the civilian side is it different at all um <clears throat> i would have to say yes i would have to say there's definitely a difference uh i guess the way i look at it, i haven't lost anybody super close to me since after the military i've lost um you know my grandparents and, and things like that and some friends um i think the big difference and that's a really good question um I'm glad I didn't get questions before this, by the way. This this makes it more organic. I like this. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to surprise oh, you as much as possible, uh, so you're welcome. I guess, you know, I guess on some of the deaths that happened overseas, you see you see your buddy that you um, you went and, you know, you had fun with, you trained with, you went through, did a lot of hard things with, and you, you see their body laying on the ground, uh, riddled with bullet holes or explosives or just crushed to death. Uh, so seeing that and knowing that man, who that man was, and then now seeing him there lifeless on the ground, uh, that takes a toll, it takes a big toll, a toll that I never thought about because you know what? The movies never really showed that <laughs> at all. Right. They don't show the, you know, the, uh, how surreal things get. And I think that's the big thing that people don't get when they're going to sign up for the military. And that's okay. It's just, it's life. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a big difference. Uh, doing that and I just you're so invested in the operations and you kind of know all the little ins and outs of it so when someone goes down you're like what went wrong and you kind of like you want to dissect it in your brain where like hey they got killed in a car crash you're like okay yeah like, like this shit like that person ran a red light like it's pretty cut and dry I mean it's 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 a tragedy don't get me wrong I'm not trying to take away from that person's life at all but yes for me uh, personally, my mind goes, I, I just really dissect it. I want to know every little detail. Uh, I want to, I want to see the body. I want to, I want to, I think, I, I don't know why, call me weird. Uh, I'm just very invested in it because it's kind of like, um, 
I'm almost like a student of war, I guess you could say. I've been doing it my, for decades and decades and decades. Like I want to know everything about it, you know, from uh, day one of training to death. I want to know it all. And, uh, you know, you know, I always thought that I was going to be one of those guys uh, dying overseas, which I was totally cool with. I, I mean, a, a lot of us were, uh, which I've said in previous podcasts before that like I was okay with that. Um, it, w- it would have been an honorable death. And people are like, oh, honorable death. Like, no, it's it's different when you your life is surrounded by this stuff. It's it's totally different. People don't get it. They'll never understand it unless you're totally immersed in it. Uh, just like I wouldn't get what life is as a doctor or, uh, you know, a teacher, right? Same thing. Uh, but yeah, it's for me personally, it's, it's a hundred percent different. Uh, it seems, um, I think I hold on to the combat death over anything. Um, you know, if I have a brother that dies, you know, in a car wreck and we're not deployed, it won't hit me as hard, but when it's overseas and especially when you see it or they're right next to you when it happens, yeah, that takes a little toll and your, uh, your mind kind of goes to, uh, to la la land and kind of just a lot of things and then then the devil really comes in he starts playing with your brain right well i I appreciate you sharing that and we'll we'll take a slight break from the heavier topics but don't worry we'll get right back into it before too long (laughs) but um yeah so so on the heels of my question earlier about kind of famous seals and everything like that there's obviously some fairly prominent seals that have kind of risen to prominence in the military but then they've risen to prominence in politics and so i remember a few years ago i read the book resilience by eric greitens i think is how you say it was his last name and you know he it was a great book it was a fantastic book and you know I've, i've said it to everybody and obviously resilience is probably my favorite word in the English language. And then he becomes the governor of the state of Missouri. And I mean, people are looking at him like, oh my gosh, this guy's going to be the next president. And uh, if you didn't know about his fall from grace, you have Google. So look it up. But uh, mm-hmm. some pretty horrific things that he was accused of doing. And, you know, this is a guy whose political career is essentially over. Um, and a lot of parts of his life are essentially over. But then you've got the other side. That was another uh, Navy SEAL. Eric Grant, which was my boat crew leader in Buds. <laughs> okay. So, so there you go. So you obviously... You know him I, I know, well as a man. Well, yeah. yeah, and so, you know, this isn't a podcast where we're trying to flame anybody. No. Uh, obviously, he's taken a lot of that on his own. But then you, you've got the other side of it, which is Dan Crenshaw. Mm-hmm. So he is a House of Representatives a member from the state of Texas. He kind of rose to prominence, really, whenever he was... Uh, he was maligned on Saturday Night Live. He had the perfect response to it. He went to Saturday Night Live and, and kind of did that whole deal. But then he, he's he been getting this huge following on Twitter and on Instagram. He was just on the Joe Rogan podcast and was incredible. And this is his guy that's in his mid-30s. And people are looking at him like, is he the heir apparent in the Republican Party? This mm-hmm. this one eyed former former seal is this the guy? And so there's kind of a you know to use Jocko Willing's favorite word, there's a dichotomy there between you've got two guys that came up through the same system, right? They're around the same age, same experiences, but they've gone two totally different directions, even though they ended up in the same place, which was politics. So. For you, when you see something like that, when you see your brothers, one that, you know, made some bad decisions and one that made some good decisions, like what comes up for you when you think about that? Uh, you know, a lot of it's a shame, like the community is one of those. Um, there's a lot of communities that are like this, but if someone does one thing bad, just one person, they kind of look at the whole community as a, as a whole as a bad thing. And I, and I always tell people there's there's 10 percent of well, just to like throw it out there, turds in everything. And we see it with teachers, you know, molesting students. Uh, we see it like malpractice and doctors. You, you mean, you, you see it in pretty much, and, and you can go, you can take your work, and I guarantee you can pick out 10% that are just not doing their, their end. They're kind of shady. They're doing some, uh, you know, bad things over here or over here. Uh, it's, in, it's in every uh, career field, in my opinion, and I've witnessed it in multiple ones. But um, uh, I actually had the pleasure of meeting Dan a couple weeks ago up in Wyoming. And, uh, you know, I was wearing my seal pin and of course uh, I knew who he was. He didn't know me. So we, we started talking, started talking about operations and I was like, so what's up, man? How'd you like, what's going on? Like, how'd you get out? Uh, and we just kind of go on. And he, I mean, he tried to stay in, he didn't want to get out. Uh, just the, the medical side of the Navy, uh, the seal teams fought for him. Uh, the medical side, they, they wanted, they just couldn't keep him cause he had one eye. Which is weird because Adam stayed. So I just like I just don't think you have the right people maybe fighting for. But he he tried and you can just see it. But the man's got a great heart. Uh, I love his beliefs. He, I can just feel it. Like you know, you talk to someone like this guy's good to go, or this person's a turd. Like he, he is good to go in my in my book. Uh, he, it was awesome to talk to him. I was very fortunate to speak with him. Um, 
it's just like anything, you know, in, in Dan's, um, you know, his experiences and Eric's experiences are actually too different. I think Dan's seen a little bit more real life things than Eric has. Uh, I kind of know a little bit of background on both on what they did. So that, that changes a man. It changes things in a man. Uh, so some people join the military uh, for a goal, and it might not be be a SEAL, and it might be a political office. Uh, so some people do have that agenda, and and they know who they are, and a lot of the guys in the teams know who they are. And that's okay. Like, if that's what you want to do, like, you know, being a SEAL is a check in the box to add credibility to what you're doing. That's cool, and that's, like, that's your thing. That's uh, that's what you want to do. Uh, but... Um, I cringe Dan was not Dan was not one of those guys. He kind of got I wouldn't say thrown into it, but uh, I don't think he was thinking about it until he was approached about it. And the guy is a phenomenal speaker. Uh, he's he's awesome to listen to. Uh, so, and and and, and that, from what I know about like Eric, when I knew him, he was an awesome guy. Like when, when I was in Buds, uh, I did not know him. I did not operate with him. I never did any deployments with him or wherever he went afterwards. So I don't know operationally. I just know him from Buds. So, but in Buds, I mean, he was awesome. We called him Obi Wan Kenobi because he could just make things happen. He was an officer, got things done for us, uh, which we appreciated. But uh, you know, some guys say different things here and there. But uh, like you said, this isn't a flame session, so so we'll cut it off there then. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is uh, Dan Crenshaw, obviously, guys like me, there, there's strong hope that someday he transitions to being a presidential candidate, maybe at least, you know, maybe governor of Texas, Senate, something like that. But right now we're in the middle of the march towards 2020. And we've got Donald Trump obviously going for reelection and all the things that come with uh, that. And then you've got the 2020 Democratic candidates who seem to be stumbling over themselves to see who can make the most ridiculous statement possible. And so, you know, Bernie Sanders will say something about abortion that's absolutely terrifying. And then Beto O'Rourke will pop his head up and be like, well, actually, here's a more terrible way of saying it. But I mean, you've got Kamala Harris and, and Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren and, and some of these these candidates. And uh, from my perspective, obviously, I, I'm very fearful some of the things that they're saying out loud it's like it's already a little bit scary that you thought that in your head but then it came out of your face mm -hmm. and then you told the world with a microphone in front of you that's a little bit strange but for for you and this is just you as, as eddie penny not necessarily the military um uh, the military guy but what are your thoughts on on 2020 on the democratic candidates on trump in general you know what, what do you think about all that oh <sighs> <laughs> I want to laugh right now, to be honest with you. You, you can, yeah, because it's, it's, it keeps us from crying. Um, oh, boy. How do I, how do I say this? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of any of them. I think they're all, um, yeah, I'm just not a fan. We'll just leave it at that. I'm not a fan of them. I don't believe in, like, really anything they say. I think a lot of them are just there for show, a crock of crap. Like, I really just think they're, they're, um, I think their moral compass is completely off. So that right there, it says like, I'm just like delete you. Like, I just don't want to even really listen to you. Uh, Cause I don't get a good vibe from them. Like, you know, the ethics are not there. It, in my opinion, that whole party, not every one of them is like that. I understand that, but that's what I get from that party. And we can see it, you know, on the news and all this stuff of um, this and that in certain cities. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan of any of them. I think the things that they said, like you just said, like, I'm going to I'm going to do this if I'm a president, but I won't do it if I'm not president. It just makes uh, no sense to me whatsoever. So I think they're most of them are a big joke, in my opinion. So that's Eddie Penny's opinion. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, Eddie, is is we understand what what's happening right now. They're running as far to the left as possible so they can win the nomination. When they get to the general election, they try to get towards the middle. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I think it's I think it's silly, and, and we don't have to go into a macro conversation about this, but it's silly how much people worship at the altar of politicians. Uh, if one if there's one thing that all politicians have in common, it's a extreme narcissism. Yeah. And it's like in in you know high school, would you have followed around the biggest narcissist and been like, oh my gosh, I love that person? I mean, maybe maybe. Maybe they're the popular person, you know, the quarterback of the football team and a 4.0 student and all that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. these these people love the camera. They love being up in front of you and lying to your face. It's something that they love to do. But I mean, I'm with you that not all everybody on the blue ticket side 
is, you know, quote unquote, a bad person. But kind of for my money, if you think it's okay to murder a baby in the womb, I can't be down with you no, in, in any all. way, shape or form. And, you know, yeah, we, we can debate about immigration. We can debate about taxes and, you know, what, what should we do with the Fed? And, and I'll, I, I think that's all great. But it is a little bit hard uh, to square that whenever you have a party right now that literally no prominent person in that party, whether candidate or currently in office, thinks that we should protect the unborn. It's it's kind of my bugaboo topic. But the, the thing that I feel like the, the 2020 Democratic candidates and, and, you know, for Trump on the right is everyone seems to be wanting to take advantage of outrage culture. And so we live in this culture where there's this hierarchy of, of people that have been oppressed. We have this um, this desire, this overwhelming desire for people. I feel like there's people that get on Twitter hoping somebody says something mildly offensive so that they can jump all over it so they can feel good about themselves for that day. And so you, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it's like you, we have this outrage culture and it's like you're overseas fighting for, for people to sit at home on Twitter and to complain about, you know, Starbucks using plastic straws. It's like, there are so many real things on the planet right. that we can be outraged yeah. about and you're worried about straws. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, we should ignore the environment, blah, blah, blah. Don't put words in my mouth. But when you hear some of the things that these candidates are tapping into and what some of the complaints are just in generalized culture, like, what do you think about that? Uh, I think it's, it's ridiculous. Cause I mean, like you just said, that's a, that's a minute thing. We'll just use the straws as an example since it's already been brought up. It's a minute thing. Uh, should we pop? Should we throw straws in the ocean? No. Does it kill animals? No. Do I love animals? I, I love them. I mean, I love them all day long. Uh, excuse me. It does kill animals, or it can. Um, right. But no, that's not. That's uh, in my in my in my mind. That's not a big deal. Another nine eleven in my mind would be a big deal. Like I don't want that to happen again. Uh, and you know, with like, hey, let everyone in, or because that's my thing. You know, you're you're talking about the uh, babies in a womb, which is a very serious thing. Uh, but, you know, like letting illegals in, like that, that's my thing. Okay, you just said it right there, illegal. There's the word, illegal. Legal is right, illegal is wrong. It's very simple. Um, but that that's my fear is uh, another, because obviously I have a security background and that's been like my, my world, uh, is I'm a, I'm fear fearful of another 9-11 because what's going to happen is like, oh, how do we allow this to happen? The government sucks. Oh, President Trump sucks. No, you're the one that wanted to let everyone in, and and are a lot of those most of those people just uh, law-abiding citizens, or will be and want a in freedom? Yes, of course, but it takes one individual to really do some damage, and uh, that's that's my big thing. And we, like you just said, we go crazy in the the political world, but like I, I get crazy on that one. Like that just drives me insane about how we're going to let uh, just people come in. We'll do this; they can do this, and like it's not, and they can. You just do it a legal way. You're you're allowed to come here. There's just a process. Do the process. And I have many friends uh, that came from other countries, and they were they did it the legal way, as a law abiding now citizen of this uh, great country. That's all you got to do. Uh, you just don't sneak in and act like you're you know legal. That's it. It's pretty simple. So that that's I'll get off my soapbox now. That that drives me crazy. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it's not a hard formula, but it's hard for some people to follow for whatever reason. But uh, another another topic that everybody loves uh, to talk about, and it's a really charged topic, is mass shootings. And obviously, you've been you've been on NRA TV. You've been asked about mass shootings uh, before, and obviously, you're you're a defender of the Second Amendment. You're a defender mm -hmm. of people being able to own firearms. You train people with firearms. You train them in a way that they can be lethal with them, so that they can save their own lives or the lives of other innocents. Uh, we've talked. We've done two entire podcasts. I think was episode 10 and episode 93 of this podcast on the subject of mass shootings. Uh -huh. But when you hear about mass shootings, when you hear about Gilroy and El Paso and Toledo, or not Toledo, Dayton, sorry, I just mm -hmm. I just pulled a Trump and said Toledo. Sorry, guys. Don't don't you don't be okay. all triggered because I said the wrong city. Dayton, Ohio. Exactly. I know what happened. Right. Dayton, Ohio. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> but when, when you hear about these things, or even just Chicago, Chicago on a weekly basis, like when you hear about mass shootings, like what, what do you think about as somebody that trains people to defend themselves with these weapons, which are apparently evil? Uh, I think a lot of people just need to kind of not think it's going to happen to them. Um, well, I also think about like, hey, this is why we need good guys with guns, because instead of having, you know, 20 dead, you might only have five dead because you had a good guy with a gun there. Um, that's obviously not every scenario. Uh, but one thing that people really need to understand, and I actually, I think I did a post on this on my personal Instagram page. I think it was yesterday, actually is uh more laws are not going to stop evil it's not gonna it's not gonna happen like all right we're gonna take away now you can only have five rounds in your magazine or now you can only have this class weapon or now you can only keep it in your house 
okay, bad guys, if they're, if they're about to go commit a felony and they're okay with going to kill a school of like a bunch of students, young, young children, they don't give a crap about your sign on the wall that says no guns allowed. They don't give a crap. This is a safe zone sign. They don't give a crap. They don't care. They're going to go do what they want. So you really need good people, um, a defense to to stop that stuff like you that's the only way like evil will always be around it's been around forever and it's not going away so the good guys need to rise up and stop that stuff and laws uh some laws are great uh but some laws are just hindering and you, you can see it in california uh new york city chicago like no guns no guns no guns well guess what guess who still has guns the bad guys the bad guys they don't care they don't care about prison some of them would rather be in prison because they have food they have a, a bed they don't give a crap. They just don't care. Uh, it's sad. I mean, like, like, oh, ban all guns, ban all guns, because someone, some bad guy shot someone. Okay, didn't they? There was, I think there was a stabbing. It was either Baltimore or Dayton. Uh, I think it was like this week, actually. So we're we gonna ban all knives. Like, we can't cut our steak anymore. Just pick it up and start eating it. Like, you, it's not gonna work. If I take a hammer to somebody, are you gonna ban all hammers? It, it makes zero sense. A gun is a tool. Period. A firearm. Excuse me. Uh, it's the individual behind it that's uh, causing the damage. Um, and, you know, people are going to say, well, you know, there's 30 rounds in this. But it doesn't matter. Bad guys, it's called the black market. Uh, bad guys are going to get their 30 round mags or 50 rounds. They don't give a crap. They're going to find it uh, to to get their point across or do what they need to do. So, yeah, that's I guess that's another topic right there. <laughs> well, I mean, um, Eddie, almost 100 percent of mass shootings occur in gun free zones. And so it's like, uh, you know, you and I, I just talked about it uh, on the last podcast where we talked about that where it's just like look adding more gun free zones means there are more places for evil people for wolves to take advantage of the sheep mm -hmm. and what a lot of these laws are intended to do uh they're intended to take the the you know force mul multipliers away from the wolves but what it's actually doing is it's taking the force multipliers out of the hands of the sheepdogs exactly. and so now you have sheepdogs that can't defend themselves and so but obviously you're a sheepdog I'm trained uh, training to be a sheepdog and trying to do all those different things uh, but I want to talk about your everyday carry so everyone's kind of obsessed with EDC mm -hmm. and I remember whenever I was buying my concealed carry weapon I I mean uh, of course I'm just going to ask you hey Eddie what do I go buy right now I don't want to do research you got paid to do that and so I bought you know the Sig P uh, P938 and you have since got the P365 for my wife to carry and different things like that. But for you on just a generalized day, what's your EDC? Uh, I usually always have a fixed blade on me. Usually you have a belly blade uh, that I always keep. I, I have two that I'll usually carry one from Dynamis Alliance and another one from Half Ace Blades because they're like my go to. Uh, then I carry my SIG uh, 320 carry. Bolt 17 rounds, always on my side. Um, if I'm working out, still have my blade on me, and I'll have a little small revolver just because, like, obviously I can't carry my uh, my SIG on me. So I, I always, that's usually my go-to. Depending on what I'm doing or certain areas, I might throw an extra magazine. Um, you know, the car always has, like, medical kits, uh, extra ammo if, I, if need be, uh, some other things in there. Uh, always got my handy-dandy lockpick set because you never know when you could be the hero. So... <laughs> Right, and it's just fun <clears throat> to pick locks for some reason. I just like I love doing that stuff. Uh, so that's usually my that's my everyday carry. I'd say probably ninety five percent of the time I've got my SIG on me, um, <clears throat> my three twenty carry. I love it. Uh, train with it all the time. That's my baby. Um, yeah, that's probably my everyday carry right there. And I, and I now, sometimes I put the light on, sometimes I don't. It just kind of depends on what's going on. I change all the time. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like when you carry, do you normally carry it with with a light or a laser or, or some sort of combo, or do you just kind of leave it without? Um, I don't do lasers. I'd say probably twenty to thirty percent of the time, I'll throw my light on, put a new holster on, just that that can obviously hold the light. And then I do the rest of the time. I do it without a light, just because it's a little bit smaller. Because it obviously there just comes that comfort. And I've got like the tritium sight, so I can still, you know, I've got other flashlights and things like that if I need to use it. But um, Again, it depends on where I'm going, what I'm doing, how long I'm going to be going, and uh, kind of just what feels right and what doesn't feel right. That's kind of like what determines what I do. Cool. Well, uh, we've had enough of a reprieve from all of the uh, the heavy stuff, so we're gonna we're just gonna kind of ease our way back into the heavy stuff just a little bit. But earlier on Thank in our conversation, much. we were we were talking about yeah. about your spiritual perspective when you were on the teams and kind of your early life and your, your spiritual perspective now. And, and you shared that story with me that I really appreciate about uh, kind of our interaction and what that did for you spiritually, but kind of give us an idea of what your spiritual perspective was when you were on the teams 
versus now. And, and before you get into that, um, I remember a post that you did on Instagram, I don't know, about a year ago or so, but you posted two pictures of yourself. There was a picture of you. It looked like you had either just gotten out of a bird or something like that. You, you were, you were deployed. And so you, you've got your, you've got your weapons on you. You know, you're still, uh, in your, you know, still dressed for war type of thing. And then there was another one where it was just, you know, healthy Eddie, not saying you weren't healthy then, but the, 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 the you know, the difference for you, I guess, if I can get my words out, was that, uh, you know, you didn't even recognize that guy that you were when you were in the teams yeah. and, and kind of what you thought in your worldview versus what you are now. And for me, I only know the Eddie from now. And so mm -hmm. I don't even know the Eddie from back then and what was behind those eyes. But kind of, again, go into what your spiritual perspective was then versus now. I guess I really had no spiritual spiritual perspective. Um, I, I like, you know, you know, I, I told uh at the time, my wife, I, I told her, I was like, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God and all that stuff. And and she said one thing to me and she goes, so does the devil. And I was like, touche, touche. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, got it. Um, and she actually kind of like got me to that camp where I met you, which I, you know, can't thank her enough for, for that awesomeness. Uh, but um, no, I, you know, I was always, I would always think about it. And, you know, when you're. It's kind of funny. There's there's no atheist in a foxhole. You've heard that that saying. And sure. I, I remember many times uh, me praying without even realizing I'm praying like God, get me out of this. Not even realize I'm saying it like I'm getting shot at. And I feel like I'm about to get shot in the face. Uh, get me out of this, like because th there's only one person I'd be talking to. But you know, I just there wasn't that relationship. I and, and you know that was the, my thought process stopped. I never got back. I was alive. Um, it was more like you know high fives. I was awesome. Like we destroyed those dudes. It was never like a, let me go, I, I'm, give me a second to go to my room and, you know, kind of like say, hey, thank you, God. Thank you for what you did. Thank you. Um, you can be choked up, man. Uh, you're doing you're welcome. You're doing a well job. You're doing really well at this. That's good. I like it. Uh, I like real. So uh, I guess, so that was kind of my perspective then, you know, it would kind of pop up here and there and I'd be like, you know, I was very prideful as a prideful man. I was like, I got this, you know, here I am, I'm a seal and there's that freaking crappy facade we've, we've discussed that quite a bit uh and you kind of and you know without even realizing you kind of like live that image you know like oh you're a seal and you're kind of like you know people are like kind of puffing you up and you and you don't it's not your intention you know and that's why like I, you said i never told you i never really tell people i do now just because i've learned that my voice kind of inspires people and motivates people and i wish i had that when i was when i was young so I feel like it's kind of a give back thing. It's not a, hey, look at me thing. It's more of like, hey, Christ is, Christ is cool. Christ is good. He's great for you. Uh, you can do whatever you want. Go get them. Like that kind of thing. It's just like to pump people up. And I, cause I think, I think people need that. I, I needed it. So, you know, I don't think people are, we're, we're all human. So we, we need that. We look at the rock. Like, for example, like he motivates me. Like the dude's jacked. There's some cool stuff uh, that motivates me. Guys that know a lot about like their history and like that motivates me. Like crap, I need to go pick up a book and read. Like Outlaw Platoon, I need to go read that. So, um, so just that was kind of my perspective. I really didn't have. I really didn't think about him or that at all. And then obviously it was gradual. Kind of gradually got in, and then we did that retreat uh, up there in Oklahoma together. And um, man. What a life changing experience. It was, um, it was amazing. It was the, the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And, uh, you know, I've, you know, I rode that high. We've talked about the high and then, you know, kind of came down from the high, then got that high and then kind of come down from that high. And now I'm at a point now where I'm like, okay, and don't get me, don't get me. I'm like this, like, oh, I'm always on this high. Like, that's not it at all. But I know, I know right. I know wrong. Um, I know what I should be doing. I know I need to be in the word. I know what's just like, I know to go work out and I know to eat healthy. Like it's, it's no difference. I gotta, you know, treat my brain right. And my, and my, especially the spiritual side of that, right. Now it's different. Now it's uh very different. Um, I don't make the same decisions. I don't make the same choices. I kind of consult with him. Um, or I lean on him as a father, like plain and simple, like, Hey dad, like I need you. Like I, it's not me alone. I'm not alone. Uh, and that's a beautiful feeling. I don't, um, I don't hold back from him anymore. I don't hold back my tears. I let them flow. Uh, it's beautiful as they drop from my face right now as we speak. Um, it, it's just, it's so, it's so amazing. And I, and I remember like when we were, we were doing that camp and this is, you know, this is no one's fault at all. I just remember thinking like, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. Like, you know, you hear like, okay, yeah, you, you should be, you know, in your devotions every day into the Bible every day. 
and uh, oh, here's tithing. You should give 10% because here's why. And here's, you should be in a, in a men's group. And here's why you should go serve in your church. And here's why, um, and, and you know, you, you should go help out the community. And here's why, and we can go down the list, right? That's a lot of things for a new believer. Uh, like, I'm like, what? Like, I've got to change. Right. So pretty much I got to become a pastor is what I'm getting. Um, right. Yeah. And, that, and that's not that's not the case. And I, and I think that kind of like, I wouldn't say deter me because I, I still had him inside me. He's like, no, it's OK. Like, that's just we'll get there. But it's just like that. It, and I've said this on my last podcast is on. It's like it's just that first step. Like, what's what's Eddie's first step in you know, my spiritual or in my walk with God? What was my first step? And for me, it was it was reading books. So I, you know, I read. I think they said Prayer Life, uh, which honestly I I did not like at all. It was just not my thing. But then I remember them saying like the Bondage Breaker. They're like, this is more advanced. I was like, cool, I want that first. <laughs> so I read that like three times. I'm like, and like, wow, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is this is crazy. And it starts setting in, and then like I'm picking up all these books. I'm like, wow, I really want to get into James now. I'm like, I'm just dissecting that and. Um, but one thing I like want to tell listeners, and and you know if this applies to you, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, but like you don't have to like when people say that they're they're not trying to like stuff all this Christianity down. You like you need to go do all this, go do this. Like for me, my first step really, minus going to church, uh, was tithing. You know, I'd give twenty bucks here at church or here, and then all of a sudden, uh, I started tithing religiously. Like set up direct deposits, all that stuff. I started tithing. I started tithing more, uh, giving more. And it felt good. Like, I liked it. Um, and literally, oh, uh, excuse me. Uh, three days later, I'm off to my first tithe. When my heart said, this is what you're supposed to do, my pay increased triple. Literally three days later, tripled. And it hasn't stopped since. I still tithe. Um, but it's just, that was my first step. And I still go to church. And my next step was not to go, you know, I, I did a Bible study for a little bit. Uh, and it was awesome. I don't know if the, the group I had was, was right for me. I kind of, it might've been forced a little bit. I just really wanted to kind of take that next step. But my next thing was uh, work on my kids and bring them into Christianity. And, um, and that, that was, that's been my step now was working with my kids. And now, you know, we pray before every meal, which is huge for, for, for me, like me saying this right now, if you, if you go back, you know, 10 years saying that like, I got my son saying, daddy, we need to pray. I'm like, you're right. We do son. We do. And just, you know, I got a text. Uh, my son was out with uh, his friend and their mom, and they just went to get ice cream or whatever. And uh, she texts me, and she goes, guess what Tristan did? And I go, what do you do? And he goes, they're about to eat. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He goes, we have to pray first. And just as a father hearing that, it, I, I just broke down. I, I just broke down. It was amazing. I'm like, and I'm doing that for my son. He's 10 years old, and I was 32. And um I mean, just the difference he's going to make in his family. I mean, it's, and it's, and it's not, it's not me. It's God doing all this and just kind of like laying in our hearts and just kind of like really just being obedient. And it was um, just like, that has been my walk right now is working on those kids and uh, strengthening our family. <laughs> Pretty deep stuff, dude. I'm proud of you. Good job. <laughs> well, well, I appreciate you offering all that up. There's obviously a lot of things to talk about in there. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, the, the example of tithing is I know it's hard for people. And, you know, some some people think, oh, I need to tithe so that I can make triple. But that's, you know, that's not the way you approach it. It's just like this is I'm being obedient and it, it looks like God bless you. But something you did bring up there at the end that I think is going to be huge for our listeners, because there's Eddie, you're, you're talking to a lot of dads right now that have sons. So what is your advice? As you know, a man that's had all these experiences, but you know, you kind of got into the spiritual side of your life later. What is your advice to a dad of, of how they should treat their son and how they should walk them into more of a deeper spiritual life? Yeah, I would say, you know, sons and daughters, because I have three, you know, I have two daughters and a, uh, and a son. Um, you know, one thing I've learned and I, I still catch myself is, is those words. And we talk about the tongue and how powerful that is. And it's throughout the Bible and we hear it in church and, uh, words hurt. They, they hurt, you know, they, they hurt, they hurt bad and they can be detrimental to relationships, which I've experienced. Um, I would do anything to go back and change things. I would also not go back because it got me to my present day where I am, which I'm, I'm extremely happy and, and very fortunate and blessed. Um, but I, I would say just, before you, I mean, be delicate with them and don't force it and just kind of, kind of give it to God. Let, let him take care of it. Like, you know, pray and 
and just kind of show little things and reinforce and just like a like a prayer, like a prayer. Like, why do we pray? Okay, cool. Well, let's go see what the Bible says. Now we're doing a little Bible study quick, and that will lead to other things. Um, God, I mean, there, there's so many things what to do, gosh, because I tell you what, man, I've done every mistake times times 50 uh, per mistake. So, um, yeah. I, I'd say your words are number one. Watch those words. When you want to say something, just go go into your room, stuff your face in a pillow and say whatever the hell you want to that pillow. <laughs> or or when right. I, I jump in the shower and I, I speak to the water, I'm like, just let it hit me. But you're just like, calm down, calm down, calm down, and then address it once you're you're calm and cool or or whatever. But um, I mean, how can you, you know, we're, we're, how can we preach Christianity and then like, I'm just spitting this foul crap out, which again, I, I mess up all the time. Actually, last night I had an argument with my daughter and I probably said a couple of things I shouldn't. I got to, you know, have that apology uh, session with her tonight, but kind of explain my thing. And I just kind of, um, it, it still happens daily. I mean, like, man, it's a, it's a, it's a fight, especially when my life was around a bunch of dudes and, and, uh, you know, the F bomb was very common. Uh, it was kind of like the, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a transition and it's no excuse. I know what's right and I know what's wrong. But uh, it's just, dude. It's like you just said. We're, we're it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a walk. It's, it's an adventure. It's a journey. It's, it's fun. It's amazing, and it's continuous. It, it just never stops. That's one thing that's so cool about it. It just doesn't stop. You know, the book doesn't end. It ends with revelations. But the book for our, for us, it, it's you just keep going and try to get better and better and just be obedient and don't stop and just, you know, even if it's uh, you know reading a little proverb here and there for them. And uh, or just giving kids books, or you know, there's all these cool like, you know, we got the U version app. We've got you know, they got, they have a kid app for the Bible, just like little things like that. It, it's so big. But there's not like really one thing. The one thing would be the tongue for sure. Uh, but that, I mean, there's just sorry about the tangent, but there's just so many things that you can concentrate on. But don't don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> do not get overwhelmed. It's not going to do anything. That's probably the devil right there, just coming in and saying, "Oh, look at all the stuff you have to do. You, you can't do this." You know, I mean, we, we've heard that voice, right? I'm sure you have. Sure. Sure. No, that's all great stuff there. That's all great. And, and the thing that I'm, I'm sure if it hasn't come up uh, for you as you're leading your, your children um, into this, I know it's come up for you and I, we we've talked about this and I know there's a lot of our listeners right now that are thinking about the same thing on the spiritual perspective. Cause obviously here at Undaunted Life, we are constantly talking about spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, cultivating those things daily. But the obvious question here for someone that used to be a Navy SEAL, well, you're forever a Navy SEAL, but you're no longer active duty. Um, how do you square the the job, which is to destroy bad guys, right? And you destroy them by killing them. How do you square that with being a Christian? Because we, we know the answer. I obviously know the answer because you and I have talked about it. But if there are people out there that maybe aren't as nuanced on uh, the intricacies of, of what the Bible means when it says uh, thou shalt not uh, kill, uh, you know, how that's different than murder. murder. But, yeah. but, but for you, I mean, when you think about that, I know you've been asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you square what you did while you were in the SEALs uh, versus, you know, your spiritual life? Well, the first thing I said was like, I wasn't a Christian back then. <laughs> but, <Okay. laughs> no. but I would do it again right now as a Christian. I would go over there right now and do the same exact job and uh, no problem with it whatsoever. Um, uh, one, I'd say pick up the Bible and read it and see that, you know, conflict, evil. Has been going on all the time. Um, you know, we have our, and we don't have our, our fights not here with, uh, you know, flesh and blood. It's more the unseen world, but, uh, it, 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 there is the flesh and blood on the battlefield. That's what we see. Uh, but, you know, it's, um, it's not like Eddie said, I'm going to go pick up a gun and go murder people. It was, it was, it's for our country. It's for the greater good, a, a country that was based off God. Uh, so, I, no, I, I like for me, like it's no, I don't, I don't even bat an eye at it. There was a time when I asked for forgiveness. I was like, please forgive me for all the killing I did, and I was forget, I was forgiven like that, like literally that second. It was actually on the drive back from that um, that uh, little getaway we did. I was, I was pretty much in tears. My three hour drive from wherever wherever it was in Oklahoma to Tulsa, I was in tears the whole time. I couldn't even talk on the phone. I could barely see. I needed like windshield wipers for my eyeballs. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was like, I was, a, I was a wreck. I mean, not it was a great wreck. It was a a beautiful train wreck. Is probably the best way to describe it. But uh, no, it's just I just heard like, and then you know, in my head, I'm like, no, it's it's okay. Like I, I know it's okay. You're good. It's fine. 
And um, no, I in my heart, there's nothing that I did over there that was that was bad. Not not one thing. I would go do it right now as a Christian, and I would come back and I would read my Bible and be like, you know, and I would say, you know, if I would still say, please forgive me of my sins and all that good stuff. But that that to me is not a sin. That is not a sin at all whatsoever. And it's not murder at all. It's in my mind self defense. And people can say, well, you're going to their house. Well, guess what? They're going to come to our house if we don't go to theirs first. So, and you know, we have certain ways to collect that data and prove that stuff. So that's kind of how that's that's my stance on that. Well, good. So that kind of that kind of covers the the spiritual resilience side of things. But let's go ahead and move on to the physical resilience side. So obviously, if anybody follows you on Instagram, it's it's pretty apparent that you still take really good care of yourself. Obviously, you had to be in great shape while you were in the Navy. Um, but let talk about physical resilience. Kind of give the listeners an idea of what your workout regimen is, like uh, the things that you like to do, the things that you do on a regular basis. How how do you keep in shape? Uh, one thing I'm going to, I'm going to throw myself under the bus is I really need to work on my diet. I love sweets. I gotta, I gotta stop that. I, I really do. A bluebell ice cream has become the death. Eddie, of the that's bad. That's bad, man. It's so good. Um, no, I, I, you know, for me, uh, it, when I started working out, I, I, the reason why I really started working out and I worked out in high school and I swam and lifted weights and all that stuff. But my real reason for like really jack and steel was I, when I was in the Marine Corps, and this, this was way back, is I saw that guys that were more physically fit kind of got more respect and got more things done, as, as crazy and weird as that might sound or, or whatever. Uh, so I just like, oh, I'll start working out. Like, I won't be the skinny kid because I was a skinny kid. And then I just started doing it. And I like, I just started loving it. I'm like, this is fun. This is awesome. And I never, and you know, I, Fell in love with Arnold from obviously his movies, but then I'd start reading his books on like, you know, the, the modern book of Ency- or the encyclopedia of modern bodybuilding and just like what he's eating and, uh, you know, what he does for legs and all that stuff. It just, I just fell in love with it. I, I never wanted to be really a bodybuilder and go do a show. I just like to jack steel. It's, it's fun for me. Now it's like a therapy for me. If I stop doing that, my body will cease. Like, it's just like, uh, cause my body's been through the ringer, uh, you know, time and time again. So, um, you know, I, I probably work out uh, minimum two hours a day. Sometimes it goes to three hours, depending on, you know, cardio, you know, I usually tack on cardio at the end of my lift session. I switch it up all the time, just like body parts, Uh, starting to do more functional training. Going to start yoga tomorrow. Not looking forward to it because I'm about to be humbled (laughs) by uh, some uh, very flexible people. So, um, which I'm, which is, which is fine. Um, so yeah, I just it's just it's part of it should be a part of your it's, it should be part of your regime like period like that's your regiment that it should be a part of that like uh, just like going to work you have to go to work you have to take care of your body and it, it's it's so have you read uh, the compound effect by uh, Darren Hardy? No, I've not. It's a great book. It's a quick read, awesome book. If uh, for guys listening, if you haven't read it, it's the Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. Great, great read. It's amazing. I've read it a couple times. I used to read it every year. Uh, so like I probably read about five, six times, uh, but it just talks about you just do one thing. Like, for example, if I, you know, if I have like, say three sodas a day, right. And I just, let's just say I cut out two of those to where I only have one soda a day. And I do that for a year. You know how many sodas that is that I just took That's out? A lot. That's a lot of sugar. That's a lot of sugar. And then, but that has a compound effect. So I just took out all the sugar. Now I'm losing weight. Now I feel better. Now I'm happier with my family. Now my family is happier with each other. Now it's a happier household. Now they're going to work or school and they're doing better. And just like it's a compound effect, how just all these things stem off of one decision, one choice. Uh, So for me, going to the gym gets me back to like normal, like just to like a good, I got the endorphins going, I'm like, I'm feeling well. And then I'm a happier person. So the people I interact with, well, uh, they get a happier Eddie. Uh, Because when I don't work out for a couple of days, I can tend to get a little cranky, um, and I, I don't like that. Uh, and neither do the people around me, especially my children. Um, so it's just it needs to be a part of your lifestyle. And there's no, well, I don't, you know, I don't do. I've heard, well, I'm, I'm just not a physical person. It, it, it's your body. Take care of your body. One thing that you're always going to have is your health. Like that health is with you until you die. Like the job you're working with right now is probably not going to be there all the way to your to the, your demise. So health is one thing. You know, eating right. And I, I kind of said I've been slacking here with the. The blue ball ice cream, especially in the summertime, I'm horrible about it. Uh, but I like, I'm like, okay. But the way I look at it, it's like, all right, I'm going to add 15 minutes of cardio because I just did this. <laughs> so I try to make it up here and there. Uh, but um, no, you got to take care of yourself. You have to. And if you just give it a shot, not this like, well, it worked out for three days. Okay, that's not how it works. 
Uh, you got to yeah, you're spot on. You got to. I mean, you're spot on. You got to commit. Go commit to uh, commit, and just the reward is is worth it. And you're just gonna fall in love. And just people in the gym are usually happy people because they're all working out and they just got a better lifestyle. And uh, you're more active. You can do more active things with your children instead of playing on a video game. So it's there's no excuse really. You should be getting out there, and it doesn't mean you need to go lift weights. If kayaking is your thing, go kayak. If running is your thing, like it's not mine, go run. Like, but you have to do something. You, you, you must do something. You have to. There's no excuse. Yeah, I mean, Eddie, that's what I tell people all the time is I was like, you know, I don't care what you're into, what the hobby is, but you have to be physical. You have to cultivate physical resilience. That's that's the ability to bounce back physically, because even like right now, like everyone loves excuses, right? Like, oh, you know, I stubbed my toe, so I can't work out for four years. But like right now, I uh, you had a little jujitsu snafu. And so I tore all the tendons in my left thumb and tore the palm. And so I had to get surgery. I just got out of the cast like a week ago. And so the thing is, is I can't I can't even move the thumb. So I certainly can't grab a barbell or a dumbbell. And so the things I'm used to doing, so like, uh, you know, bench press or pull ups or deadlift or any of those things like that's that's several months from now, maybe. Right. right. right? But if I took that time to just, oh, you know, Kyle, this is a, a good time to relax and let your body recover. I was like, well, my body can recover in about three or four days. Mm -hmm. I don't need to take off three or four months. And so, you know, you get creative because if physical resilience is a lifestyle, then you just do what you need to do. So I've, you know, just this morning before we got on uh, on the phone to do this, I hit squats for the second time this week. And then I'm still hitting a lot of core things. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm running more sprints than I normally do because it's yeah. like, OK, well, there's not a whole lot of things I can do. And I try to get creative with my cast. I was like strapping stuff to my cast to like like bands. And I'm like pulling the bands, you know, with my cast on and like just trying to get something to where you're working out your body. But it just kind of has to be a part of your normal uh, regimen, as you mentioned. And and so obviously we've talked about spiritual resilience. We've talked about physical. The last part is mental resilience. And some of that comes from cultivating physical resilience. So mm -hmm. as you're doing difficult things like lifting weights, like jujitsu, like swimming, you're, you're kind of building up that mental resilience. But then there's the other side. There's there's reading books. There's, you know, having conversations with people that are a little bit beyond you. But for you, what do you do to kind of focus on or cultivate that mental side? Uh, mental. That's my baby right there. Uh, I think you got that. You, you got uh, everything wrapped up pretty darn good because it all starts with that brain. Um, wow. Another another good one. I do a lot of mindset books. I love mindset books. I love them. Um, a lot of them are redundant, uh, but I like hearing it again because it, it doesn't hurt um, at all. So I do a lot of audio books on that stuff. I like listening to um, certain podcasts on that on that on that topic, and I, I just it, it's awesome because it's so it's so. Another thing I do is I follow a lot of on my like, Instagram. It's just quotes. You know, they got some of those pages like mindset quote uh, pages or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Like my feed is literally filled with that. I will just read them all. I'm like, I like this. I like this. I like this. And then in my brain, it'll stem something that's going on with my life. Or I'll be like, wow, that hits me. I need to kind of get this out there. And I'll kind of push it to other people. And then like just the feedback I get from like, hey, thank you. I really needed this. Um, and, and, you know, I needed it too. So like, why not give back a little bit? And uh, that's that's a big thing. Like, if I just read like a motivational quote, it might sound cheesy or corny. I, I really don't care. It works for me, and that's uh, that's what I need. Uh, that that just gets my mind. I'm like, you're right. I can do anything. You're right. I can. I can. I can. And I will believe it, and I will do it. And I don't change my mindset. I don't let any negative thoughts in. I used to be a big warrior. I really don't worry at all anymore. I mean, I've had times where, uh, you know, relationships, things with children. Uh, things with work, a deal, whatever it is. And I'm like, you know, what's going to be is going to be. So I have a choice to worry about it and stress and, you know, chew my nails off. Or I can just be like, hey, we're going to push forward. We'll let this come out. I'm going to do what I can do to uh, to make try to make this happen. But I'm just going to keep moving. I'm going to keep a smile on my face. I'm going to enjoy life. Because at, at the end of the day, you know, in that, like probably a, a couple days or a week, what I'm worrying about, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. Obviously, if it's a loved one that's sick, it's a little bit, a uh, little bit more different. But it doesn't mean you still have to go to negative town and just uh, be miserable. There's no. That's not. That's not what we're meant to be. Our brain is not programmed like that at all. You know, it's not. So um, that's just that's my mindset. My mindset's very huge. I use it for everything I do. I try. I'm very optimistic. I'm extreme. I used to be very, um, you know, pessimist a big time. Uh, and like, oh, this is going to happen. Kind of you're like, you were just talking about like, oh, you're, um, 
you know, I'm afraid my wife's going to die or something like that. Like I, I've had, I definitely had those thoughts, but I, I have a choice. Do I want to think about those thoughts or do I want to like focus on like, wow, like my wife is so beautiful. She is so awesome. Uh, my kids are so important to me. They are kicking butt in school. Life is good. I've got a lot of good friends around me. Uh, God rocks. Like, look at all this cool stuff like, that he just does for me. Uh, so, like, you have that choice. We have that choice, and the choice comes daily, hourly, minutes. Every minute, every second it comes, you have that choice. So it's kind of up to you as the individual. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Are you going to focus on negative things? We all have negative things. You're not the only one out there. And I'm not talking to you, Kyle. I'm talking about, like, to the to our listeners. Uh, you, there. It, we all have negative things. You're not alone. You know, it, you know, it says in the Bible, you know, everyone's going through the same thing. Um, this, you know, this not so good thing sometimes, but you have that choice to focus on the good or the bad of things. And I choose to do positive. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes I go down the rabbit hole and I'm like, wait a second, uh -uh, back to it. And I'll correct myself really fast. Um, instead of, you know, something that would last maybe an hour, it might last a minute now. So I, my mindset's huge. I feed it with good things. It starts with that Bible in the morning, um, which, you know, and then, you know, my mindset books on the way to, uh, on the way to the gym, might throw in some crazy music, some Breaking Benjamin or something. And sometimes I'll just listen to an audio book while I'm working out because it still pumps me up. I'm like, yes, my brain is powerful, like all that stuff. So, uh, and that might not work for everybody. It might work for some, it might not work for everyone, but just you got to find what works for you and, and take it and run with it. That's awesome, man. And, and so, Obviously, we talk all the time about spiritual, mental, physical resilience. But another thing I talk about all the time is cultivating, you know, male relationships, community with guys kind of in your area. And I, I actually get messages quite often about guys that are like, man, I just I don't have guys in my area that, you know, we don't do. We don't have the Sunday night jujitsu group like you do with your guys that get together, and read books and all that. Or, man, you know, I don't have the police academy anymore. I don't have the army anymore. I don't have whatever the situation might be. But but for you, what would you say to those guys as a guy who? Who lived in those types of male communities, those high alpha competitive mm -hmm. brotherhood type communities for so long, but you've been out of that for several years. Right. And so you've kind of had to do what you can to cultivate that on your own without kind of the, you know, the, the strictures of, of the government and the military basically forcing that upon you, whether you wanted it or not. What would you say to those guys that are having trouble making those connections and having that male community? First thing I'll say is I know it sucks when you leave that community, go that brotherhood and guys always got your back and you just feel like you're really a part of something, which you are. Uh, that's still there. It's still there. Like I still, you know, communicate with, um, you know, guys that I served with. Um, I've actually got a group here in Dallas that get together, which I've been kind of bad about. They get together for UFC fights, you know, uh, cookout, Super Bowl party, stuff like that. So I still have my team guy buddies, like my kind of like my, my people, but, um, you know, you make new ones. Like I kind of, for the first time, you know, once I got out, I was like, you know, I've got my, my family. So I made my family my crew, which the some are like, uh, well, no kidding, Eddie. But yet, you, like, I'm telling you, <laughs> I was not in a good place. Um, you know, I just kind of like that. Like, I got to raise these guys until, until you know, this day, and then they go do their life. Uh, but I made them my crew. So, like, you know, that kind of like brings into, like, you know, the praying together and, you know, kind of like talking about the days and what you do. Um, and, and they're asking, and you know, now they ask me about work and what's going on, you know, where, what, you know, what country's going on over or what's happening over here and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, I made them my crew and I never did that before. And then, you know, I got new friends, um, the people I work with, they, you know, kind of bringing, we're kind of getting, uh, together and kind of starting to talk about certain things that, you know, get more personal, which is great. I think that's important. Um, but you can still, you know, it, it really just takes, you know, if you're, if you need that, then pick up the phone, call somebody, text somebody, Hey, let's get together. Let's go discuss this. I mean, you know, a lot of times that I found myself doing this for years, it's like, man, this, this is really boring like this. I am really out here alone. And, uh, you know what I did about it? I moped. I didn't do anything about it. Um, call, set something up, take the initiative and go do it. That that's I mean it really because because chances are if you're going through it they are too so they're like oh my god so glad you called I've had that happen a couple of times um you know I reach out to a buddy like ah oh, so glad you called I need some man time let's go chill and then or let's go shooting or something like that so um it's yeah it's on you you got to do it Make initiative. Well, and spoiler alert, guys, that's the same advice I give to everybody. So you when go. you email me or when you message me, I'm like, well, what are you doing? 
because everyone's kind of looking around him and Han and, you know, kicking the daisies and they're like, well, there's no, I don't have any friends. It's like, well, go make some. We're mm-hmm. like, well, I don't have a jujitsu group. I was like, go on Amazon, buy a couple of mats, set them out in your garage and invite your neighbors. Like just do something because that is such an important thing to be able to have mm-hmm. iron that you can sharpen iron upon. Right. And, and like when I tell people all the time, when iron sharpens iron, that's not a, a nice, easy process. That's not like, you know, two bottles of water hitting into one one another. I mean, there's going to be sparks. There's going to be fire. There's going to be pieces that are flying off at different points. And so when you engage in that male community, you need to be ready for it. And I don't mean spend the next two years trying to figure out what you're going to do to get ready for it, but you got to go out there and do it. Um, well, Eddie, we've, we've gone through a lot of different topics. And so as we kind of get down here towards the end, I want, I want you to kind of give a sense, uh, to the listeners of what you're doing now, like kind of what you've done post military, the different things that you got going. So specifically, I want to talk about contingent group. I, I talked about that, introduced that, mm-hmm. uh, from the top in terms of the kind of what that is. But just from your perspective, what is it that you're doing? What made you start contingent group back in 2013? Kind of give us that story. Uh, so contingent group, like you said before, it's a risk mitigation kind of security services, more higher end, uh, for, people traveling outside of the country to keep them safe for their whole organization. Uh, we kind of design the security. Uh, we also do it domestically for you know individuals, families, high net worth, but we're starting to try to just mitigate risk for just every individual. We started a thing called, um, as simple as this, you know, a risk snapshot. I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's on our website. But like just sure, yeah. people that are traveling, like, hey, we're going to, um, you know, we're gonna go over to France to go to Paris. I mean, for like 20 bucks, you can literally get like, here is the trending crime. Here's what's going on. Here's what not to do. And, and it's a quick read. It's a one pager and it could literally save your life. And you don't have, and you don't have to go purchase this. You can just go do your own research. Like literally what's trending crime over in France. Um, you might not, it might be a little digging and stuff like that, but that's okay. Um, if you don't want to spend the money, but if you're going anywhere, you need to really learn to do that. Uh, we, a lot of guys have their blinders on. Oh, we're going to go on this tropical vacation, like to Maldives. Okay, well, did you know that not so long ago the government was a huge uprising, and that's the last place you wanted to go? Uh, so, like, just little things, like we don't use taxis or stuff like that. Like, just um, that's what we try to push is get smarter about it and just kind of educate yourself. A uh, period of wherever you're going about what's trending, what's going on, and keep your you and your family safe. So we tr- we do a lot of that push. Uh, but I mean, we, we do everything, a lot of kidnapping, um, and extortion stuff, keeping people safe that are traveling, uh, tracking money for embezzlements. I mean, you name it, physical security, designing security for, uh, I mean, you name it, we, we, we do it all. It's, it's, um, it doesn't, it's, it's crazy. I'm like, wow, well, yeah, we can do this. Sure. Of course we do. And I'm like, well, we just reach into, that's right. He's got this, um, he went to the school we can do that. So it just, it keeps growing and growing and. And just the feedback we're getting is like, thank you so much. And we do our tips on Instagram, as you know, and people love that. They're like, thank you so much for this. And it's just good to keep people safe. It feels good to like, because a lot of people don't know that. Like, they don't know not to get in a taxi in Mexico because chances are you might get kidnapped because that's how the, some people make their money down there is by kidnapping. Yes, it's a business. Um, so just little things like that. And we just try to mitigate it for whatever the client is. Everything's customizable. Um, we do a lot of. Um, traveling overseas to some not so great places. And we just keep our people safe and work with um, local law enforcement and our vetted, uh, our vetted crew of people and, you know, just kind of go from there. But every, it's just, it's so broad. I could literally talk for probably hours on all the stuff we do. You'd be like, Holy crap, you guys do that too. Uh, so it's just, you know, background checks. I mean, anything and everything for everybody uh, to mitigate risk for your business and your family or person and organization. That's what we do. So big, big thing right there. Uh, also, um, started writing a book. Uh, that's, that's a big thing. So I already got the agent set up, uh, got my ghostwriter. We've got a few chapters done. Um, pretty excited about that. Uh, really getting into the weeds about faith, a little bit of military stuff, but, uh, really about the faith piece. Um, so that's going to be coming hopefully, I'd say probably within the next year. And that's just me totally guessing. So don't hold me to that. Um, and then just some other little projects, uh, some other little startup companies here and there. So just, just, I don't know, man, and having, and enjoy my family and having fun and just, um, obviously working out. <laughs> so you're, yeah, so you're not bored. So you got not stuff bored. going on, but I will say this, since we're out here on the interwebs, people are listening to us. I remember like six or seven years ago or wh- however long ago that was you telling me about the fact that you were starting a book 
mm-hmm. and then you've kind of gotten off of it and then you got <laughs> back on it. So I hope this time is the time because oh, it's I want to read it. Whatever it's the, the it's thing is, it. I want an advanced copy. I want to do the edits. I want to do something. Like, I want to read this thing yeah. because I know it's going to be Contracts awesome. Contracts but- are signed, so there's there's no, uh, you know, before it's like Eddie vomiting on paper, uh, <laughs> now, you know, at fifth grade level. So now it's actually got some uh, context and, you know, chapters are we're a few chapters in and working on book cover designs and all that good stuff. So it's uh, it's, it's definitely moving forward at a good pace. So we're, we're, we're pretty pumped about it. Well, well apparently... You're kind of a big deal because just this week I was looking <laughs> on social media and you've got your own hat now. So it's called the Penny Hat. So it's it's Eagles and Angels mm-hmm. and it's this this program called Cloth of Heroes. And I think uh, this hat for you is is going to support a, a nonprofit that you're a part of. So, so tell us about about the Penny Hat. Tell us what it's going to support and kind of give us an idea how that all came about. So the, the Penny Hat is really this guy. He is a uh, ex um a spec operator, tier one guy out of uh, on the army side started this uh, this organization, and you take uh, you know camouflage utilities stuff that we wore overseas, and they he cuts them down and like makes patches with them and um, uh, hats. So there's only 96 hats they sold out in a couple hours. So there's no more. He asked if I wanted to do another run. Uh, I go sure, I'll definitely do another run. So probably maybe in the next couple months, I'm going to send them top and bottom probably a different pattern. So we're kind of working on a design to get some more of those hats out there, but the proceeds, some good to him so we can do what he's doing for the good things. Um, and then the, uh, the charity I'm doing it for the organization is next one up in Baltimore. And what they do is they take inner city kids. And, and I went out there for a speaking engagement. Uh, my, my friend runs it a uh, good friend now runs it, but he, um, he takes these inner city kids and where all they knew is crime, gangs, and just not and not really studying and doing drugs. He kind of takes them out of that environment and gets them an education. He's got them going to college now on sports scholarships. He's got them working out. He's got them. Uh, he's, he sets up tutors. He deals with their schools. Make sure that he deals with the cops so they like get wrapped up in something not so good. But the, the things he's doing, the life changing, just being out there to see it, my, my, I fell in love, and I was like, how can I help? Uh, so I'm on the leadership team out there and help what I can. And sometimes I got to help. I talk to individuals that want to do, uh, similar things that I did and just kind of speak to them in a, uh, in a positive way. Cause they, they don't have that. And, uh, and in Baltimore is not a great city. Uh, um, there's, you know, there's, it's not at all. And there's a couple of cities and, you know, I'm hoping that this kind of spreads to other cities as well. Cause some other cities des- desperately needed to get these kids out of here. Cause I mean, these kids just don't know any difference. You know, they're just like the new the gang life. Um, there's there's a, a better a better and bigger world out there than that. So uh, that's what they're doing out there. But it's it's an amazing organization. Uh, next one up is them, and they're out of Baltimore, and they just uh, can't can't uh, say enough good things about them. That's awesome, man. Well, hey, we have covered a myriad of different topics. I mean, so many firsts. First interview, first time we've gone this long on a podcast. But, buddy, we we really appreciate everything that you've done on this podcast. I know that there's a lot of stuff here for guys in your community, outside of your community. But uh, do you have anything else you want to get off your chest? Uh, I'm good, buddy. Just for the listeners, uh, always do the right thing. I'd say that's number one. Just do the right thing. You know what it is. You hear those little voices. Do the right thing. Sometimes we kind of fall on that, but uh, pick yourself back up and continue on to continue on the fight. Well, awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. And guys, before we let you out of here, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know, by now we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. And specifically we do that by providing content like this podcast that helps you forge spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So for today, I'm going to kind of give you a rundown of everything that we've gone over. So I want to give you a link to Eddie Penny's Instagram page so you can follow him and contingent group. And I also have the website for contingent group there. I've got the link for the penny hat. So it's all sold out, but you can at least go there and maybe save that into your bookmarks so that you can come back whenever those go back on sale. I've got the link to the next one up Baltimore website. So if you guys want to check out what they're doing for those kids, if you want to donate, that's all there. And then also I have a link to the fearless book by Eric Bland, which we talked about on here. Eddie, is there anything else you want our listeners to know? I'm good, buddy. Just thanks for having me on here. It was awesome. Uh, Thanks for getting me out of my comfort zone and making me cry like a little girl. I appreciate it. (laughs) Uh, It's good to, you know, let, you know, people know it's okay to let loose once in a while. You don't have to always be, um, Put that facade about being a tough guy on there. It's it's okay to let it loose once in a while. It's it's there's nothing wrong with that. 
Right. Well, thank you, Eddie. And thank you to all the listeners for listening to this podcast. We really do appreciate it. If you would, please subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or Google Play and refer your friends to listen. Guys, if we deserve a five-star review on this podcast, please leave us one. That is how this podcast is going to continue to get out and continue to help more guys. Let us know why you like the content. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the remainder of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. So if you want me to come speak at your company, to your men's event, to your church, whatever, hit me up, email info at undaunted.com. Life. Again, that's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Our website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at undauntedlife or facebook.com backslash undauntedlife. You can check out our free devotionals on the Uversion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song King of Sorrow, which is off their latest record entitled Phantom Anthem. The links to all of this are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>